And that summarized research findings from uh, the past several field seasons. But today we get to hear the most recent up-to-date research on spotted lanternfly. And many of the work you'll be hearing today are from researchers who have relatively recently started their work on lanternfly. And so I'm really excited. We have such a great um, turn, we had such a great turnout in terms of having 20 presenters. And I'm looking at the attendees now, we have um, 133 folks so far logged in, so that's great. Um, for the presenters, I have, you know, we'll start off here shortly. And so since we, since we have 20 presentations, um, I'd like to ask all of the speakers to please stick to your given time. And in this webinar format, um, we're not really able to jump in and interrupt and keep you to time. So I'd ask you to please um, set your phone, set your watch um, to limit your time to your stated start and stop times. Um, because some people um, are only able to attend uh, certain talks so they might be logging in and out um, based on their schedules throughout the day. So we wanna stick um, on time to our agenda. Um, all right, so uh, for people who are who have questions, um, please uh, put your questions in the chat box. And so if we have time during, you know, when the speaker complete, uh, finishes his or her talk, if there's time, um, Heather and I can read those questions to the speaker and they can answer there. But if not, um, we're not asking the speakers to watch the chat box. That's too confusing to do. Uh, they can answer the questions offline after their presentation. And so speakers um, will, if we haven't already done so, will promote you to panelists. And if you want to show your face like I am, you can um, go to the bottom left of your screen and click uh, start video. Um, but you don't have to, whatever is easiest for you. So with that, let's um, get our first speaker lined up. And so our first speaker is Laura Nixon um, from USDA ARS. He'll be talking about developing behaviorally appropriate monitoring monitoring tools for Lycorma delicatula. Off to you, off to you, Laura. Thanks, Julie. Okay. I'm gonna set myself a little alarm, so if it starts beeping, it means I only have a minute left. Um, okay, so I'm going to speak with you today about a two-year collaborative project on um, developing behaviorally appropriate monitoring biosurveillance tools for spotted lanternfly. Um, this work was done in conjunction with a lot of people and a lot of help. Um, and just like start by saying thank you to them. I'll also end by saying thank you to them. Um, so since I'm the first speaker, I get to be the first person to bring up the distribution map. As most people probably are aware, spotted lanternfly is an invasive species originating from China, India, and Vietnam. Um, the US was not the first country that it invaded. South Korea and Japan had established populations before we did. Um, now, the initial US detection was in Berks County, Pennsylvania in 2014. And this map is, is showing the current currently known distribution of SLS in the US. So as you can see, it is focused around the mid-Atlantic states um, with the blue counties showing counties with established populations and those ringed in red having um, state quarantines in place for this insect. Um, the small spots are just um, uh, individual findings of SLS um, around the states. <clears throat> so the current surveillance Procedures for this are uh, traps and lures. So there is a standard sticky band that is attached to uh, the trunks of host plants um, and a methyl salicylate lure that is commercially available. Um, and this is placed in regions where um, SLS presence is unknown. There are also um, dedicated visual survey teams um, organized by both state and federal departments um, to go around and look in areas where SLS may be present, um, sort of on the fringes of the infestations. Um, there's also a big, been a big utilization of the public eye, um, as these are quite a big, bright, attractive insect, so the public is really taking notice of these. So on this map, the two big red arrows are something that I've added in. Um, so I just wanted to highlight here um, Clark County in Virginia and Berkeley County in West Virginia. Um, these infestations were found late last year 
Um, and these were, despite there being traps and lures up in these areas, these first findings were um, by visual survey teams. So I just really wanted to highlight our need here for an improved by surveillance tool beyond the traps and lures that we currently have. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the risk posed by spotted lanternfly. It is a univolpine um, insect that is a phloem feeder. Persistent feeding of a population on a host plant will cause wilt and in some cases die back. Um, some of our big, uh, tr uh, big plant species of concern are of course grapes um, and fruit trees. Then there's also the uh, ornamental and hardwoods um, like black walnut and maples and things. Um, it's often bandied around that Tree of Heaven is the primary host of SLS, since we see it on Tree of Heaven throughout its entire life cycle. So a lot of people are like, oh great, we'll just get rid of the Tree of Heaven and we can get rid of the SLS and that's the only thing we need to worry about. But the big worry with Tree of Heaven is it's an invasive weed. And in this region anyway, it is kind of everywhere. So you have Tree of Heaven growing along railway tracks and up against tractor trailer storage facilities and all along the highways. So if SLF really needs this tree to develop, as a lot of people are saying, um, then you can start to see how this insect might hitchhike around the country and find places to establish quite easily. So the key questions for our lab going into this research in 2018 um, were how effective are these sticky bands that are being deployed? As mentioned earlier, and here's a picture to demonstrate, that these sticky bands are just taped around um, host plant trunks. One big problem with these is that you get a lot of non-target capture on the band. Um, so we really want to look at um, an effective trap that reduces non-target capture. And then does the recently identified attractant really increase these trap captures? Once we've looked all, at all of this, we can begin to develop a sensitive monitoring system to track potential further spread. So in 2018, our lab tried out three different um, trap designs. Uh, these trap designs were deployed both with and without a lure. Um, so these traps were deployed in two populated states. Um, our lab put them up in Winchester, Virginia, and then um, Heather and Julie found sites in Pennsylvania to put these traps up at. Um, so the designs were the standard sticky band and then a small circle trap, which anyone familiar with weevil research will see is just a weevil trunk trap. And then um, a protruding circle trap that's something we came up with. It's sort of similar to the circle trap with the skirt that goes around the trunk. However, that skirt was more protruding and had a larger capture device. Um, this was quite a late season <clears throat> um, experiment. So I'm only going to show you the adult capture data from this season. So as you can see from this data, um, there wasn't really an effect whether the trap was baited or unbaited. So the lure didn't seem to have much attractiveness when these traps were deployed on host trees. And the small circle trap um, seemed to capture almost as well as the sticky band did. However, the problem with this is the small circle capture device became saturated with this larger insect quite quickly. So 2019, we wanted to divide up the trap design and lure efficacy into separate studies so we can focus in on the effects. For the trap design, I really wanted to combine the important features from 2018 to produce the best, best passive trap design. And we really needed full season data, starting from weeks of first hatch or as close as possible, to see if there's a trap design that works for both nymphs and adults. Then separately, we set up a trial of the commercially available lure to test the efficacy when it's not associated with a host plant. So looking just at the passive trap designs for monitoring, we have the sticky band and the small circle trap as per the previous year. We then have this modified circle trap, which we use the same skirt um, design that goes around the trunk from the small circle trap, but we added on the larger capture device from the protruding trap that we made. Um, and then the fourth design was a, an experimental design sent to us by Trace. Um, it was similar to the modified circle trap and they were looking to see how effective their design was. Once again, we collected data in two populated states. So uh, we were down in Virginia and Heather was doing this up in Pennsylvania. Five replicates of each trap design was deployed on secondary host trees in Winchester and um, on Ilampus only in Pennsylvania. The nymphal capture season went from May to August and the adult capture season went from July to October. 
Um, so this is the weekly um, nymphs per trap per week capture in Winchester, Virginia. As you can see, the modified circle traps captured significantly more than any other trap design. Um, and then <clears throat> the phenology graph here, you can see that as SLS developed, we were capturing less and less of each life stage. And with the adult capture, there wasn't really too many significant differences in capture here. The only difference was that the uh, trace experimental trap caught significantly less adults than any of the other designs. Now, with this experimental trap, this skirt was actually made of a different material than the circle traps. It was like this wire material. And when we observed it in the field, we actually found that adults would climb into the skirt and they didn't seem to like walking on that material. So they would fall back out of the skirt before getting captured. Um, so we think it was that probably had a lot to do with the capture. Um, and then we saw similar trends in Pen with Pennsylvania captures. However, the sticky band did capture numerically more than um, the trap designs at every other trap designs at every life stage. Um, but in terms of significance, the modified circle trap did just as well as the sticky band. Um, what I would like to highlight with these two graphs next to each other is just how many more nymphs we were capturing than adults. Um, and this kind of went hand in hand with other research I was doing last summer, where I wanted to look at the dispersal capacity of each life stage of SLS. So I did these vertical climbing assays, whereby you stick a bug at the bottom of one of these climbing tubes and measure how far it climbs in 15 minutes. So if it reaches the top, you flip the tube over so that it can continue climbing. Um, and these are the results from that. So as you can see, the nymphs seem to have much more of a push to climb vertically than the adults did, which kind of lines up with our uh, trap captures. We often saw um, in the adult season that we may only have a few adults in a trap, but there would actually be maybe 50 adults sat on the trunk of the tree underneath the trap, just sat still. Um, so this all kind of lines up. And then um, <clears throat> a recorded non-target capture one week out of every month of the season um, for each trap type. As you can see, the um, sticky band numerically caught significantly more um, non-target organisms than any other trap design um, and it also captured a larger variety of organisms including vertebrates um, so we did see birds and skinks we also saw some bits of squirrel on there um, whereas the we didn't see this kind of thing with any of the circle designs um, and all of the circle designs were capturing mostly ants in them uh, so the red portion of the hymenoptera that's that's mainly ants that we're seeing um, another problem that I sort of observed early in the season with sticky bands is that they get so much non-target capture that actually a lot of the sticky area is getting covered up with other things like fly, black flies and, and butterflies. Um, so I was wondering if this would have an effect on capturing SLS. So we um, did an occlusion study whereby I affixed sticky bands to Ilanthus that had populations of SLS on them um, and occluded a certain percentage of area with paper to mimic the occlusion created by capture. Um, so we had a control band that had no occlusion and then we included bands with 25, 50 and 75 percent paper. Um, there were three replicates for this and it was changed and counted weekly throughout the season. Um, <clears throat> the graph that you're seeing on screen, this is the nymph capture um, for the sticky band occlusion. And as you can see, there was actually no significant changes in capture when there was any occlusion on the band. So what we were seeing with the nymphs is they just keep running um, up the band until they find a sticky area to get stuck on. So they'll run over the islands onto sticky. They'll run over like the bodies of other dead SLS to get onto sticky areas. Um, but then we saw the inverse with adults. We actually saw that any amount of occlusion caused a significant decrease in capture. Um, and Again, sort of observations in the field, we saw a lot of this picture that you're seeing on screen. Um, we saw a lot of adults actually using the island to avoid the sticky area. Um, also, with the adults being larger and stronger, we saw this with adults and a little bit with both in stars as well, that they're actually, if they just get a bit of their tarsi on the sticky, they can actually have the strength to pull themselves off and remove themselves from the sticky band. So, 
Moving away from the different trap designs and onto the commercially available lure. Um, so we used a vertical tree mimicking bioassay system, which is essentially a fence post stuck in the ground because um, we wanted to keep the visual stimulus of a host plant, but we wanted to take any olfactory interference out of the way. Um, these posts were installed along a wood line with a known SLF population. We had uh, three, repeat, uh, three replicates of a blank control and a commercially available lure with containing methyl salicylate. Um, the stickies were, uh, these were affixed above sticky bands and these were checked and, ch checked and changed once per week and we um, re-randomized the positions of the lures versus the controls each time. So this was the season-long capture that we saw with the lure. There was, we were actually not seeing any significant increase in capture between uh, when the lure was present as compared to the control for either nymphs or adults. So uh, what we found from these two years is that uh, we've sort of found a modified circle trap design that performs just as well as the sticky band, but um, significantly lowers the capture of non-targets. Um, adult SLF movement doesn't seem to be as compatible with current trap designs um, as with nymphs. Um, so what we really need is a lure that's really attractive and will bring the adults up into the traps and give them a reason to climb. So our next steps are to continue to look at our trap design, see if there's a more behaviorally, behaviorally compatible design, or if there's a different way of deploying these that work better for adults. Um, search for sources of attractive stimuli for potential lures. And once we have a really good system in place, we can then start to evaluate trapping systems in low density areas. Um, thank you so much. I may have time for questions, but I wanna thank my uh, lab group. Also Max Upfin at Virginia Tech extension has been a great help these last couple of years with giving us sites and observations and all the people that give me money so thank you so much thanks so much laura that was great and i'm sure there's an audience behind you clapping <laughs> uh, just imagine it um so a reminder to all the attendees there to um put your questions in the chat box laura we do have um two questions coming in for, for you one is where do you purchase the circle traps sorry where do you purchase the circle traps? Um, so the circle traps that I showed here are actually ones that we made. Um, so we have um, great field technicians in our lab group that built the traps themselves. Um, however, we are still working with Trace to improve their trap design. They've sent us more experimental circle trap designs to work with um, based on our feedback from last year. And Trace and Great Lakes IPM do actually sell circle traps for various insects. Okay, great, thank you. It looks like we're out of time for questions, but thanks very much. Thank you. All right, and then up next will be Donnie Peterson from Rutgers University, who will be talking about monitoring lanternfly uh, with eDNA. Donnie? Thank you. Let me see if I can get this up and running. Come on. There you go. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone. This is gonna be my first online one since all this COVID business. So today I'm gonna to talk um, some of our research group with the Lockwood Lab and, and Nielsen Lab uh, and Rutgers with looking at comparison uh, eDNA uh, versus visual surveys and then some other work that I'll be hopefully doing this summer if we get to get outside of our homes eventually. So a lot of the spotted lanternfly stuff was handled by Laura uh, previously, and so I wanted to start out first just talking about eDNA, and it's this idea that we can get e, um, DNA from the environment. Uh, a lot of this is done in aquatic systems, and uh, so often it's uh, the example is uh, Asian carp in the Mississippi watershed, where we can essentially get a cup of water from the uh, um, from the river and then filter that water down to extract and, and extract the DNA and use the targeted primers, we can um, detect the presence of the uh, animal there. And it has a lot of um, advantages of using this. Uh, you don't physically have to have the animal present um, to detect it in this way. Um, so we can use this for biosecurity um, if we're uh, curious about other insects or um, other invasives um, at 
course of entry. Um, there's also the satellite populations um, that we can use it for uh, detecting like, uh, like the Pittsburgh population uh, that just recently popped up. Um, we can also use it for delimiting the um, currently expanding reg region of uh, spotted lines from fly. And we should be able to get a relative abundance um, also at uh, specific sites. So uh, the implant, uh, use, uh, this was initially designed uh, for uh, brown mining related stink bug, which is a big uh, invasive insect uh, in agricultural systems. And similar to that insect, spotted lantern fly produces copious amounts of honeydew, uh, which allows us to transition the aquatic sampling into the terrestrial systems. Um, and again, because both these insects are around for a long time uh, of the year, uh, it's, they're good model systems to use eDNA with. Um, and obviously, spotted lantern fly can be quite abundant um, in some locations, and so and it feeds on a number of hosts. Uh, uh, and so with, we have two methods. Um, we have one, uh, which is our water irrigation method. This is walking through uh, either in forested settings or tomato plants or vineyards is for our, our experiment I'll be showing here is we spray water from the top down and we collect it into a bucket. And then we use vacuum pumps to um, draw the water down through a filter where the filter collects the DNA. We can then take that filter, uh, store it, and then um, uh, bring it back to our lab where we can then extract the DNA and then quantify it with qPCR and then determine whether or not spotted lantern fly was at that location. A second uh, method that has been designed is with tree rolling. Um, obviously, spotted lantern fly gets up in the trees and we need to sample high up in the tree. And so these uh, long poles can be used to essentially paint the tree um, with rollers. And then we can then use water to um, uh, running water across the filter, uh, the paint roller into a bucket and then filter that uh, bucket of water um, down into a little uh, filter paper and again extract the DNA and quantify it with qPCR. Um, as with a lot of the aquatic systems, we need to validate um, these methods with currently conventionally known methods. And as uh, Laura was talking about, there's two methods that are out there right now, which is visual surveys and trapping. Uh, what I'll be presenting today is with visual surveys, which is usually the uh, often uh, the, like for example, is one of the most uh, ones we see pop up first with spotted lantern fly. As we can see in this older USDA figure, a lot of the blue dots are visual findings of uh, spotted lantern fly. Uh, and then similarly in vineyards, um, obviously you're walking through uh, and they would use visual inspection to find spotted lantern fly. And so uh, we were comparing eDNA versus visual surveys. And we did this at two time points in the year. One was during uh, uh, mid-September uh, when there weren't as many adults, they're kind of aggregating on Lanianthus. And then the second one uh, time of year was done in uh, October where the females would begin to disperse and looking for oviposition um, locations where we'd expect higher amounts of um, spotted lantern from fly detected in the vineyards. So in total, we had 12 sites in New Jersey um, sampled with, at each site we sampled four plots, which was uh, uh, one row of uh, uh, grapevines of 12 total in each plot uh, length. And we use the water aggregation method where we again um, would spray water onto these tomato plants. And as we're um, collecting the water on those plants, we'd also be visually inspecting for the um, spotted lantern fly at each of those lo locations. Here's just a schematic from um, that roughly summarizes what we did, which is collecting from a uh, large spatial area, the vineyards, where we then aggregate that water into a bucket. And then um, we try to concentrate it down onto the filter paper, which then that filter paper is just uh, put in a little um, file, which is transported back to our lab, where then we can extract the DNA and again, quantify the amount of DNA that's there if it was present. So looking at the first um, set of data, we can see on the x-axis the number of spotted lantern fly that were visually found. Um, on the y-axis, we have the total amount of DNA that was detected 
from the eDNA sampling. Uh, in the round one, which is consist of our September sampling, our open circles, and then the round two are these filled in red circles, uh, which was sampling and done in October. And as I hope you can see that uh, we detected no living adults uh, visually uh, on the first survey. We did find we have an X mark down here, which was um, one dead adult that was found in one um, uh, plot. But as we can see with the second round um, in October, that um, eDNA, uh, we definitely picked up a lot more eDNA, but we also picked up a lot more um, adults uh, on those spotted lamps, um, on the vineyards and grapevines. And so this uh, correlation of number of um, spotted lantern fly to the estimation uh, to estimated DNA uh, get, can give us, a, give us a estimated relative abundance of insects at those locations. And this is very similar to other work that um, our lab group did in Philadelphia and urban forests, um, just with the paint roller method. And we have similar um, trend in the data where as we have a number of visual spotted um, lantern flyer detected, we have increase of the DNA. If we looked at the detection probability, this is based on occupancy models. Um, overall, we had a higher probability of detection with eDNA at these sites, about 86%, in contrast to visual, which is about 35%. Um, if we look at the sampling effort, which is uh, we have on the x-axis the number of plots, in contrast to the cumulative um, detection probability on the y-axis. And we have two different sampling time points here. On the left one is the September one, and on the right is the um, sampling done in October. And then with two different lines, we have the red line, which represents eDNA, and the yellow line being the visual surveys. And then on the top, there's this little dotted line, which is this 95% um, threshold that we kind of want to reach to have a reasonable degree of success of what uh, determine whether or not spotted lantern fly is located there. And overall eDNA uh, required less sampling to have a 95% confidence that we detected it or not with 12 plots um, at the September time point and, and 30 needed for the visual. Uh, with a second time point in October, we can clearly see that there was more spotted lantern fly as we saw with the previous data. Um, and that, that drastically reduced the amount of effort needed with only five plots needed and uh, for eDNA in contrast to 15 needing to be visually inspected. So overall, we were finding that eDNA is, uh, is, a, is viable for early detection as it's done in aquatic systems and with uh, uh, previous terrestrial uh, findings. Oops, sorry, went ahead on accident. Uh, while visual surveys are easy to conduct, it can miss cryptic adults. One of the advantages of DNA uh, of the eDNA is we can detect up to seven um, seven day old DNA that was deposited there. Um, in contrast to visual surveys, when you're walking through a patch, you're only sampling what's there currently. And if you're only monitoring, let's say once a week, you're missing seven days of data potentially in contrast to our eDNA. If it doesn't rain, we can pick it up. Um, and so overall, it, it can help decrease the amount of time and effort, and it can be used for help delimiting the edge of spotted lantern flies. It continues to spread. Um, we could help find isolated populations like they found in, um, Penn, in Pittsburgh. And similarly, we could help uh, confirm visual sightings. For example, in California last fall, they supposedly found a spotted lantern fly at UC Davis. Um, and they went, uh, the state agencies went there and looked for it, but they couldn't find it. Um, we could have came in and uh, tested with the eDNA and then helped maybe find it quicker and uh, with the honeydew that may have um, laid on that plant. And so that's most of the findings we have for that. Um, I wanted to also present some of the future research that I'll be trying to work on, which is uh, trying to improve our current methods. Um, with it, specifically in the field, I, was, I wanted to try to look at um, improving our tree rolling methods. Unfortunately, this has been delayed because of COVID. Um, but the idea is that in, the, in a vineyard, it's easy to walk around with a bunch of water and filter um, in the field, but in the uh, in vineyards, but in the, in the field, especially uh, rural forests, it's much harder to get to those trees. So it's the idea that we want to try to reduce the more water by simply just getting some water into the initial tree roller and then bring it back to our lab and, ex and then um, getting the DNA off of it later. But uh, and then also standardizing some of the methods that we'll be using in the field. 
Um, currently, what I've been working on in simulations in uh, collaboration with uh, Mike, Michael Allen, also at Rutgers, a postdoc, where we've been designing uh, simulations to try to test uh, different methods of using eDNA in the field and uh, different and comparing it with visual sampling and um, traps that we will hopefully be getting to with our final um, uh, project in collaboration with Tracy Lesky Lab in West Virginia, where we want to compare the modified USDA traps. Um, that's a trip. Set myself an alarm. Uh, and we're going to hopefully compare these. Um, eDNA with traps, the other conventional methods, and then hopefully look at some of these dispersals of spotted lantern fly of nymphs and adults later in this summer, and maybe uh, create some of these cool heat maps. So with that, um, I'm done. If you have questions, if I have enough, if I don't have enough time, I have my email up there for questions. Um, this work, it does come from USDA uh, funding and NIFA, I think is the pronunciation, but that's all I have for now. Thanks, Johnny. Nice job. Um, again, pretend there's uh, some clapping going on behind you. <laughs> um, so we do um, have two very similar questions, um, both related to cost and how expensive mm -hmm. this technology is. And if I can ask you to stop sharing your screen, um, so that Kasha yeah, can get no that hers loaded up, that would be great while you're Okay. Ready. Yeah, so the cost currently is set at, uh, from, from discussion with Dr. Lockwood, um, I think we have it right now at $200 for five samples, and a sample can consist of anywhere from one plot, one tree, or it could be as large as like one area, like one vineyard. And it depends on how much we concentrate down, but I think that's the re most recent numbers is $200 uh, for five samples, which can, yeah, again, sample, your definition of sample can vary. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions um, from the audience? Um, oh. Dennis had one. Um, he wanted to know what was the lowest uh, spotted lanternfly density um, population density that um, allowed eDNA to be uh, to detect it? Oh, off that specific one, um, I think it was down to a couple were spotted in contrast to the DNA we picked up. Um, but yeah, I'd have to go back to that specific figure, um, which I can pull up on my you can, Or you can answer him on the chat. That's sure. Um, and then, well, yeah. Go ahead. There's another, uh, there's a, a couple of questions that are also in the Q&A box too. So just if you want to deal with, um, deal with sure. it offline, that'd be great. That was awesome, yeah. Donnie. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, Kasha, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Kasha, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> No worries. Um, so up next is uh, Kasia Madalinska from Rutgers University, who will be talking about uh, spotted lanternfly egg masses. Okay. Just Let me share my window. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble figuring out how to work this. How do I share this? Don't worry, so there's a green button uh, with share screen. Oh, right, right in front of me, there it is. Okay. Slideshow and start. Okay, can you guys all see that? Well, we can see your presenter view. I don't know if that's um, oh, what No, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> I'm sorry. There it is. All right. Yep, that looks great. Okay. So um, I'm presenting on spotted lanternfly egg mass distribution in wooded habitats for Rutgers University. So spotted lanternfly is an invasive species in New Jersey and is prolificous with over 70 known host plants. Some of the major host plants that we've identified in New Jersey include um, that have been utilized a lot by a uh, spotted lantern thre uh, fly throughout their life have been um, tree of heaven, grape, and black walnut. There is no host plant preference for oviposition. So spotted lantern fly originally came to um, New Jersey in 2018 and was reported in northern part of New Jersey, including like Warren and Hunterdon County. Through 2019, it's expanded to nearly 
uh, border all of Pennsylvania counties all the way down south to Salem. Rutgers University has a um, spotted lantern fly um, report site where individuals can report where they've spotted the lantern flies. And um, in 2018, you can see that there's a lower density of reported site sightings, but most of them were concentrated up north in um, Warren and Hunterdon County, with a few outliers down in Camden and Cape May. Fast forward to 2019, you see that the uh, number of reports has significantly increased, as well as the density, basically. So the variation in size that you see in the points includes the number of um, sightings for that one particular site. So uh, most of it is once again concentrated in Northern Jersey, but you can see almost a halo effect going around all of Pennsylvania, uh, the border states of Pennsylvania, down through New Jersey to our Southern counties. From what was a one report in 2018 has now expanded to multiple reports. On the bright side, the report in Cape May in 2018 was not, there was no future reports in 2019 there. So it's good notice on that. Um, Egg masses are oviposited in both exposed and covered location, organic, non-organic materials, basically anywhere. Um, Pennsylvania has a longer history of spotted lanternfly invasion as well as a higher density. Here in New Jersey, we're still in our first and second year of invasion, and these leave our populations and densities to be at a medium and low level. Some of the observations that we've seen in um, New Jersey include um, we have a delayed movement of our adult spotted lanternflies into our vineyards, and you can see adults feeding on vines um, in about September, followed by OV position in October. Uh, this image is a picture of a tree bark. When we first walked up to it, the exterior of the tree didn't show any egg masses present on it, the gray part. Once we removed a couple of layers, one layer, two layers, you could see there was like a smooth, um, next level of bark, which exposed multiple egg masses underneath of it. Um, so in 2019, we surveyed several vineyards and did some work with phenology for spotted lanternfly. We marked off some of the um, host plants that we saw um, the lanternflies feeding on throughout the season, such as uh, the black walnut, grape, and tree of heaven. We visited those sites every week, we looked at them, and there seemed to always be some sort of a spotted lantern fly presence. When we came back to look for egg masses, expectation was that maybe it would be wallpapered with egg masses. That was, however, not the case. We actually didn't find any egg masses on any of the trees that we marked for um, what we saw spotted lantern fly activity for the entire 2019 season. So this came as quite a shock to us. And um, as we know from previous research done, that spotted lanternfly will basically lay their eggs on anything. So why not lay their eggs on our um, host plants that we've identified, that the, the exact trees that we've marked that we've seen the activity on there. Like this picture shows a rotten bark with tons of egg masses on the inside of it. One of the things that we see very consistent with our New Jersey vineyards is that there is wood edge at some point touching our like some point adjacent to our uh, to our vineyards. So that got us thinking, how can we identify some sort of a pattern or are there any variables, any patterns that can provide us with some sort of an insight that could help us be more successful in finding egg masses? This led us to our objective, determining distribution of egg masses in wooded habitats adjacent to vineyards. We had, we sampled um, three farms across New Jersey. Uh, as six farms across New Jersey, three of the farms included um, in spotted lanternfly presence in 2018, as well as continued through 2019. Those are marked in uh, yellow. And then the blue ones are recent spotted lanternfly sightings on these farms in 2019. So um, we took the um, adjacent wooded edges of the six vineyards in New Jersey sampled. We had a total of 157 sample points that were included in the study, between 15 and 52 sample points per vineyard, and a four to, four to six replicas of each transect 50 feet apart per sample were done. The depth at which we went into the woods included 100 to 400 feet, and each of, for consistency, we kept each of the samples 50 feet apart. 
from one another. Um, to each of the trees we sampled where we selected at land, each of the point, sample points we selected a tree at random. We checked for presence or absence of egg mass. After that was recorded, we included a three minute visual conducted within a 15 foot radius of any additional egg masses that could have been present on any, uh, any trees or any objects in that area. This proved to be very valuable in places of really low density, such as seen in our southernmost part of New Jersey, as well as in areas where um, branching of the tree trunk had multi it went in multiple different directions. Um, within that same 15 foot radius, we checked for the presence of tree of heaven and grape for each of the sampled tree. So this is a visual representative of one of our sample sites. On the right hand, on the right, right top corner, you see um, represented with the grapes, that's where our vineyard would be located. And along the edge of that is our wood edge with five transects extending into to the interior of the woods. The lines are as, uh, pretty straight. <laughs> um, we used three factors, three variables, to try to assess if there was any sort of pattern or relationship with finding with the presence of egg masses. So these three variables included distance from wood edge, uh, presence of Atlantis, and presence of grape. So we ran a multivariant test. Um, the we a multivariant test to see the explanatory variables show any significant relationship to egg mass presence. For uh, distance from wood edge, we saw no effect. Between 157 samples, there seemed to have zero consistency among whether the number of egg masses or the presence of egg masses and the distance that we saw them from the wood edge. It was completely random. Um, Atlantis was inconclusive due to the lack of samples um, due to the lack of samples that we had at Atlantis and all our sites. So that leaves us with grape. Grape proved to be statistically significant. The presence of, a, the presence of an egg mass is best explained by the presence of grape. We looked at this in uh, the probability of use it if grape is present and grape is not present. So um, our results showed that you have an 80% probability of finding an egg mass with the presence of wild grape and a low of 8% with no grape present. This study shows that egg masses were positively associated with wild grape in wooded habitats adjacent to vineyards. This could possibly, this information could lead to um, guide surveys for egg mass searches in recently invaded regions. Thank you to the uh, Nielsen True Fruit, Tree Fruit Entomology Lab and my support from the USDA. Thank you. That's it. Thanks, Kasha. That was great. Um, so a reminder for um, everybody who's attending to please um, either use the Q&A box or the chat box to ask any questions. Um, and Kasha, I have a question while we're waiting for some others to come in here. Um, what recommendations do you give to, to growers from this sort of uh, information given that we have a lot of egg masses kind of throughout the landscape. Um, that is for Ann Nielsen to give recommendations. <laughs> okay, um, and then <laughs> we can see if uh, if I can make her um, able to talk if she wants to answer. I'll, I'll work on it while you get the next question if you want, Heather. Sure, yeah, but I, um, I have a follow-up question um, with, uh, did you look for egg masses within the vineyard as well as outside of it? We did not do an official survey for inside the vineyards. Um, we just looked for the outside. We were just generally looking at presents that we weren't seeing a lot, but it's just best of a like speculation. There was no actual like survey that we did to say, to, to, to quantify what the numbers were inside the vineyard. And there's another some question. of the vineyards that we did see, though. Um, so some of the early ones that we had in 2019, they had maybe one adult female that they spotted in their vineyard the entire time. So that's why we were seeing like, what could is there a potential that they could have an issue like maybe the next year? And where are these egg masses? Yeah, that's a really good question to know if that's associated with yeah pressure next year. Some. Yeah, I'll be really curious to see those results uh, <laughs> once you have them. Um, yeah. We have another question. Um, how high up in the trees did you see? We did um, up to 10 feet because uh, we decided that was the best that we could possibly see um, and positively identify. 
how high it goes. Um, it didn't, so we did see some trees that were surrounded. However, a lot of consistency in trees that we did find was that we noticed a lot of egg masses um, at the very low level of small trees, which is very interesting. Great. Um, and then I don't see any other questions. Anne, you are, um, have the ability to talk if you want to answer the question about grower recommendations. Right. Nice job, Kasha. Um, so we're still trying to kind of get our heads around um, what to make of this, because if we're seeing egg masses in the woods, um, but not in the vineyards, uh, we know that that is an increased risk. So at, at this point, it's more of a early warning sign, you know, which is works really nicely with the eDNA surveys that we've done too. So the growers where we've located egg masses in the vineyards, uh, in the woods adjacent to the vineyards, we're just alerting them to, you know, a higher risk for the coming year right now. So, but we're guiding most of our management recommendations to not to save for against the adults, but to maybe target, um, if they do see nymphs in those vineyards, targeting mid-season sprays for other pests like Japanese beetle which will also take care of any nymphs that are in the vineyard. Okay, great. Thanks, Anne and Kasha. Any other last minute questions from, oh, maybe there's one more. Um, yeah, so Lisa, Kasha has a question. The picture you showed of an egg mass hidden under the bark, what species of tree is that? Um, I am currently working on trying to identify the species of each of the trees that we did find the uh, egg masses on. So that information is to come in the future. All right, thank you very much. And Joe, um, you're up next if you want to go ahead and get your um, uh, presentation loaded. Um, so our next speaker is Joe Keller, who's with Penn State, and he's going to be talking about dispersion patterns um, of spotted lanternfly egg masses. Can you all hear me? Yep. Working? Okay, good. And my screen's showing up. Yep, I see your um, uh, not presentation mode, I guess. Yep, there it goes. Looks great. Okay, great. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Joe Keller, and today I'll be talking about dispersion patterns and sample size estimation for spotted lanternfly egg masses. So accurate pest density estimation helps to guide management. Locating the population boundaries can be crucial for managing isolated populations of a pest and appropriately allocating your management effort can increase efficiency. If you know where there are high densities or lower densities of a pest, you can manage where management is most needed. And accurate estimations of the density before and after management is applied can help to evaluate whether management practices are effective at reducing density. Understanding the dispersion pattern of the pest that you're focused on managing is important to guide sampling. So clump distributions require more samples in order to accurately estimate population density. So quick cartoon of different dispersion patterns. We've got a uniform dispersion pattern on the left here, random in the middle, and then a clumped dispersion pattern on the right. And just some, like a cartoon of sampling in these different scenarios. You can see with uniform dispersion, these three quadrants shown by these blue squares do a good job estimating population density, but with a clump dispersion pattern on the right, you have the potential to, to miss a lot with a highly clump dispersion pattern. So for spotted lanternflies, egg masses are an attractive life stage for density estimation. They're stationary, so they don't move around over time. They're also present for a long time throughout the year. So they're present during the winter. It's the, the longest duration life stage for spotted lanternfly. Uh, you can also see them well in winter when there's less uh, vegetation that can block your view. And there's also reduced risk of accidental transport as you're out doing your field work. Unless you manage to get a branch stuck in your trunk with an egg mess on it, you're not less likely to carry a hitchhiker along with you. However, there's a drawback to egg masses as a target for your sampling, and that's that they, many of them can be inaccessible high up in trees and harder to detect. Uh, up in a tree. So the project goals that we addressed here are to investigate egg masses vertical distribution on the uh, tree of heaven to see if the egg mass counts that we get when we look up to a height of three meters 
correspond to the total egg masses on trees very well if yeah how how good these three meter height cutoff counts do at predicting total egg mass numbers. And we also aim to characterize egg mass dispersion patterns uh, at two different scales, looking at how eggs are uh, distributed over trees within plots and also how egg masses are distributed across plots at larger scale sites. And finally, we, based on the information that we got to calculate sample size requirements to estimate population density with various precisions. So in order to look at the vertical distribution of egg masses on Tree of Heaven, we cut down 54 uh, Tree of Heaven trees at two different locations in Lancaster, Pennsylvania and Westchester, Pennsylvania. And we measured the diameter at breast height for these trees and we counted all the egg masses in three meter uh, vertical sections, basically working our way up the entire tree. And you can see here are histograms showing the, uh, uh, the number of egg masses that we saw in different height categories. So you can see here most egg masses were found over three meters in height here. Very few actually were under three meters compared to the total counts that we got um, over the whole tree. But we did see a strong relationship between the total number of egg masses on a tree and the egg masses that we were able to count under three meters for small trees in particular. So this is looking at only at the trees that we observed with a diameter at breast height under 25 centimeters. You get a strong relationship between, on the x-axis here, the number of egg masses that we saw below three meters and the number of, and on the y-axis, the total number of egg masses that we saw on the whole tree. So that's reassuring that at least for small trees, the the egg mass counts that we see up to three meters correspond well with the total number of egg masses on a, on a given tree. So the next part, uh, assessing the dispersion uh, patterns for egg masses, we sampled egg masses in two contexts. We looked at rural woodlots, where we had five sites with four plots per site, and we also looked at uh, street trees in a suburban residential area with four sets of five trees, and these trees were but I'll, I'll start with the woodlot sampling. So in the woodlots, we laid out 3.69 meter radius circular plots randomly within a forested area and counted all egg masses under three meters in height. And we counted old and new egg masses separately. And we measured all the trees within the plot, the diameter at breast height. And we also looked over other surfaces, including dead limbs and rocks. Uh, the plots that we were looking at contain tree of heaven, black cherry, black walnut, ash, hickory, maple, birch, and oak species, among others. For the suburban residential sampling, we had four sets of five red maple street trees that were selected within a housing association. And one set included a pin oak rather than a fifth red maple. And we looked in spring 2019 and counted all egg masses under three meters high on these individual trees and counted old and new egg masses separately. And so we looked at the data at two different scales, looking at the dispersion patterns among trees within plots and also among plots within sites. And for each of these contexts, we regressed the mean crowding, which is a measure of how clumped up the egg masses are against the mean number of egg masses and examine the slope. And slopes here that uh, greater than one indicate a clumped distribution, equal to one indicate a random distribution, and less than one indicates a regular distribution. And so we found for looking at distribution across trees within, within a plot, we found similar dispersion patterns for, for both scenarios, for rural woodlots and uh, suburban street trees. So the slope here around 2.5 for, for the woodlots indicates an aggregated uh, dispersion pattern and similar for the suburban uh, plots, the slope of 2.3 indicates aggregated dispersion pattern. And then we also found within the, within the rural woodlots, we found that egg masses were aggregated within, within plots. So uh, and that was true for when you looked only at new egg masses 
only at egg masses and at all egg masses across these three different categories we arrived at similar slopes all greater than one indicating an aggregated dispersion pattern and so based on this information we can estimate the the sample size requirement in order to to estimate the density of egg masses at a given location with a given precision so here on the x-axis we have the mean density of egg masses at a site and on the y-axis, we have the number of trees that are necessary to sample in order to accurately estimate the population density with the given precision. So the different lines here show different precisions from a precision of 50%, relatively low precision as this solid line, up to a precision of 25%, this dotted line. And so you can see at low densities, uh, in order to accurately estimate the density of uh, egg masses that requires many more trees to be sampled. So for low density, even you're looking at sampling 75 or more trees uh, in order to estimate that with 50% precision. But as density goes up, you require fewer trees to be sampled in order to get an accurate estimate. So at high densities, say around 10 egg masses uh, per plot, that gets you to under 25 trees required to sample with 50% precision. And you can do this, a, this, a similar thing for the, the trees in suburban residential areas. These show the curves there. And so in conclusion, we found that dispersion patterns were similar in the different contexts that we looked at in the rural and suburban trees, uh, across individual trees and across uh, fixed area plots and also looking at new or old egg masses, you arrive at roughly similar dispersion patterns, all aggregated. And uh, we found that for small trees, at least, there's a pretty strong relationship between the, the number of egg masses under three meters and the total number of egg masses present on the tree. Uh, but also, as we looked at the egg mass distribution vertically across these trees, we found that most of the egg masses are above three meters. So egg scraping with is likely to miss a large proportion of the egg masses on these trees just because they're too high up to reach for scraping. And the next step here is to, to think through how these observations can inform sequential sampling plans to guide practitioners in the field as they determine uh, the density on their, their targeted area. So that I'd like to thank uh, some co-authors on this paper. And I guess I'll take any questions. All right, thanks so much, Joe, nice job. Um, we have one question uh, that came in through the Q&A um, of how high up in the trees were you able to successfully uh, collect egg masses from or look at egg masses? Yeah, so these trees, we, they, we took them down, so we, we covered the, the whole surface of the tree, basically. And uh, so you can find egg masses all the way up to the, the top, as long as there's branches that are thick enough to fit an egg mass on, we saw them very high up in the trees. So with some of these trees, I think the tallest tree we, we looked at was up to 24 meters tall. So across a, a, good, a good range of sizes, yeah. Okay, great. And then I have a question um, related to, you know, we sort of have this uh, anecdotal reports of collapsing in the core area, you know, where lanternfly first started. Um, do you think you would expect different results if, if we are seeing a population collapse in the core, um, if you sampled in, in geographically different areas from where that infestation first started? Yeah, that's interesting. I think, yeah, that's, looking at the old and new egg masses might, the idea is hopefully down the line that comparing the two can tell you whether there's a decline over time or an increase in the population size over time as you get the last year's eggs compared to this year's eggs. So that might be one way to, to look at decline or not. But the, the idea is that uh, the, the dispersion pattern is similar uh, at higher and lower density sites. It tells you that your sampling method should probably be similar to might have lost my train of thought there, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I got, I got it. Yeah, thank you, okay. that answers my question. So, um, Joe, can I ask, uh, so Joe, was the Fraunheiser property um, close to the core? 
That's the one in Lancaster, I believe. I could be yeah. wrong. I don't know. It might be, you know, if you're if you're doing something more in peripheral areas and pop-ups, you might be able to. It's hard to compare across years, but you might be able to do it with data from this year. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, sampling more at more low density sites is something we're working on trying to do as well here. If I could just, this is Dennis. If I could just intervene a little bit here too. I mean, we had some very low density sites that were part of the, the sampling that we did at some of the locations there. The Wal Walther location had, you know, very low densities, whereas, you know, the ones where the tree, at Christmas tree farm were very high and everything in between. Uh, the Fraunheiser was the site that was in uh, Berks County and the Flory was the site in Lancaster County uh, that we went to there. Thanks, Dennis. And uh, Joe, we've got one more question for you, um, and we'll give you a break here. Um, are there any studies regarding the use of the same trees over years, and do you think you could detect egg masses um, from two to three years earlier? I don't think we've, I don't know of any repeated sampling of the same trees year to year, okay. uh, but it is it's possible to detect them at least one year later, and I think that's something we've working on is marking egg masses and seeing how long they persist over time. So we don't know yet if, if they will persist for two to three years, but that's a question we're trying to answer in the future, I think. All right, well, thanks very much, Joe. Appreciate um, your presentation, great job. Um, and the next speaker um, has canceled their presentation, so that means we get a coffee break and maybe a, a chance to give a heads up. four days and then remove them and give the vines kind of like a recovery period um, that lasted another three to four days before we reintroduced lantern flies back into the cages. So uh, this project covered a lot of different um, aspects of grapevine production and physiology, but I'm really going to be focusing on two main questions that guided uh, a big part of our research. The first of which is how this differences in density affected uh, vine physiology, but at two different levels. One, the leaf level, so in terms of photosynthesis and canopy functioning, and then at the whole vine level, so really looking at how lanternfly is affecting the movement of sap throughout the whole vine. And then a second component is looking at um, carbon and nitrogen metabolism and nutrition in the grapevines. Um, Lanternflies are intensive feeders, as you all know, and it's likely that they're extracting a large amount of carbon and nitrogen from the vines. So we really just wanted to see uh, how this was actually playing out. So for the first um, question, in terms of grapevine physiology, as I mentioned, we were looking at the leaf level. So we wanted to look at gas exchange or simply photosynthesis. Um, and at the whole vine level, we were looking at uh, sap flow and the movement of sap through the vine. And related to this, we thought that as you increase lantern flight density, you would get an increase in photosynthetic rate and vine sap flow in the low treatments. So those vines exposed to 50 lantern flies per vine. Um, so really we were thinking there'd be some kind of compensation in response to lantern fly feeding at low levels. But then this compensation response would be lost once you were exposing the vines to greater um, and more intensive population densities. So, uh, to, to really kind of, I guess, to get into the leaf gas exchange component and the photosynthesis component, we just measured um, photosynthesis or carbon assimilation and leaf transpiration and somatoconductance conductance at the end of each infestation cycle to really give us an idea of how the leaves and canopies were responding to lanternfly infestation. So this first graph, um, I'm only going to show you the photosynthesis data because the transpiration at the leaf level and the stomatal conductance have the same trends as, as exhibited here. But you'll see on the x-axis we have dates and these correspond to the last day of each infestation cycle. So August 30th was the last day of cycle one and then so forth um, through cycles one through four. And we didn't carry this data collection all the way into mid-October because uh, the weather was too bad for us to do these measurements because it requires sunny weather. Um, so we had to stop at cycle four. And then on the y-axis, you'll see photosynthesis expressed as a percent difference from the control values. So that's why you only see three bars corresponding to the low, medium, and high for each date. 
And what you see is that um, at cycle one, there's actually not a significant difference at all from the infestations. But then as we progressively moved across in time through the experiment, we saw a significant difference in the high treatment by the second cycle. And then as each cycle continued, we saw uh, progressively more significant differences in photosynthesis. And it is important to note that uh, as this is late in the season, so the grapevines are already going to be having reduced photosynthesis as the season progresses. Um, but despite that, we were able to see significant differences uh, based on lanternfly population density. And essentially, the higher the density, there's a greater, quicker suppression of photosynthesis. So and this, is, this has important um, implications for grapevine health and grapevine carbon assimilation. So then the other component of this, at the whole vine level, we were considering and uh, thinking about sap flow. So to measure this, we just installed the sap flow sensors. You'll see uh, right here, it's a small sensor that wraps around the trunk. And then essentially just estimates and gives us an idea of the total sap moving through the vine. Um, so with these values, we were able to calculate the average daily value per cycle and then really see if the lantern flies are affecting the total amount of sap moving through the vines. And so this graph, I realize is a little crazy, so I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, but to give you your bearings, again on the x-axis is the infestation cycle dates, on the last day of each infestation cycle. And then on the y-axis is the average daily sap flow expressed as liters of sap per uh, day per meter squared leaf area. And the reason we have the meter squared leaf area is because there's a lot of variation in between vines based on sap flow values and we really wanted to have comparable, be able to compare the vines. So we had to standardize it to the canopy size. So what I'd like to show you here as I walk you through this is that before the experiment even began, we collected about a month's worth of baseline data. And you'll see that uh, unfortunately, even though we randomly assigned treatments to all of our vines, we did have higher sap flow in the high treatment vines compared to the low medium, uh, low medium and control vines. So we factored this into our statistics in order um, to use this as a covariate and really parse out, parse out this variation and see if we saw a lanternfly effect. So once we began the experiment and began exposing uh, the vines to lanternflies, we did see, uh, you see here in the high vines, this brown line, a really sharp and steep decrease in sap flow relative to uh, the other treatments. And then, so even though they started out higher in the beginning part of the season, or the beginning part of the experiment rather, by the time we got to our third cycle uh, infestation event, they all started converging. And then once we actually moved into the latter end of the experiment, uh, late September and thereafter, we started seeing a separation of the treatments themselves such that the low began following the control and then the medium and the high vine started tracking together. So you're actually, we saw this effect that high lanternfly population densities um, were able to reduce sap flow. And even by the end, the high vines were significantly different from the control and the lows. So now the next question we need to consider is, are these differences biologically relevant for the vine? Um, what do they mean? And that's something that we're actively exploring right now. But again, similar to the photosynthesis data, we did see that as you increase lanternfly density, uh, there was a greater and quicker suppression of sap flow. It's also important to note too, yes, there's an overall trend across this whole graph. Um, this is again late in the season, so already the vines are going to be uh, moving less sap, but despite that, we did see a treatment effect. So moving away from uh, the photosynthesis and sap flow data, well what about uh, primary metabolism and carbohydrate and nitrogen? For this, we thought that uh, the, low, the low treatments would actually have a maintained carbohydrate and nitrogen status relative to the controls. So any carbon and nitrogen being removed by the lantern flies, the vines would seek to replace that to essentially give them a status quo uh, kind of level of carbon nitrogen metabolism. Whereas for any densities hi higher than the lows, we expected to see a decrease in sugar and nitrogen. So to measure this, we looked at both starch and soluble sugars in stems and roots. Um, and you know, this is a commercial vineyard, these great, they're not annual plants, so we can't rip them out and destructively harvest them and analyze everything. So we wanted to pick both above ground and below ground tissues. 
that were easy to sample, but also representative. Um, and it's important to note that these sampling dates coincided at the very end of the season in mid-November. And we did this because we wanted to see if there was an accumulative effect on both carbon and nitrogen um, across the whole infestation uh, cycling and uh, experiment. So here you have the stems on the left and the roots on the right, and this is starch values uh, expressed as milligrams per dry weight. And you see that there's really no difference at all in the stems. But when you consider the roots, we did see a reduction in starch in the roots for the medium and the high binds, and especially a significant uh, reduction for the medium. So this is important because this is showing that um, not only are the lanternflies affecting carbon metabolism, but they're affecting starch. And starch in the roots act as an important storage um, form of carbon for next season's growth. So there's potential implications here that we would like to explore further. So then um, when you consider nitrogen, again, we did late season sampling. And here you see a very similar kind of trend such that the stems didn't have any significant differences in percent nitrogen. But when you look at the roots, there was this reduction and a significant reduction for the high. Um, so the lanternflies are effectively affecting not only the starch concentrations of the roots, but also the nitrogen. So there's less nitrogen being moved um, down towards the roots. But then we also sampled leaves. Um, and the reason we did that is because uh, nitrogen is a really mobile nutrient in grapevines and the young photosynthetic leaves at the top of the canopy um, really quickly respond to different uh, changes and shifts in nitrogen metabolism. And you see we had two sampling dates. One, this is correspond to cycle one, and this is cycle four or uh, one of the, the fourth um, cycle or the fourth infestation cycle. And you see by that point, there is a significant reduction in nitrogen in the leaves, the young leaves that are photosynthetically active in the medium and high treatments. And this is showing that, um, again, not only the lantern flies affecting nitrogen metabolism, um, it's possible that the vine is, but this reduction is due to a remobilization of nitrogen from these leaves to other sinks in the vine, or even that the lantern flies themselves are acting as a sink and potentially removing this nitrogen. So the medium and the high levels of, nit of lantern fly densities are affecting the nitrogen in the, in the leaves themselves. So then um, a lot of this results ask the question, well, how are the lantern flies actually doing this? Are they simply removing all these metabolites or are they inducing some other kind of effect that is leading to these changes? And what we noticed was that in the tissues, the stem tissues from the low, medium, and high treatments, we saw these brown markings on the phloem um, that, weren't, that weren't shown in the control vines that had no lantern flies on them. And we think this is potentially damage or some kind of at least, yeah, yeah, tissue damage from the lantern flies feeding themselves, which made us think, is it possible that the lantern flies are actually obstructing the phloem? And this is what's leading to a decreased photosynthetic rate as this would lead to reduced uh, sugar translocation. And we're actually, going to be measuring this in the coming weeks by measuring foliar uh, soluble sugars from leaves that we sampled last year because um, if there is a reduction in sugar translocation we would see that by corresponding um, soluble sugar concentrations in the leaves and if we did see this this would mean that the lanternfly feeding is uh, not only inhibiting photosynthesis it's doing so by um, reducing sugar translocation and effectively shutting it down through that means. So to give a quick overview of our results, um, we did see that increasing lantern fly density did affect not only uh, physiological parameters at the leaf scale, but also the whole vine in terms of um, photosynthetic rate as well as sap flow. And then when you consider nitrogen and carbon metabolism, we saw that the low lantern fly densities did not affect the carbohydrate and nitrogen concentration in any of the vegetative tissues analyzed, but that the medium and the high did and specifically, they reduced uh, starch and nitrogen in the roots and foliar uh, samples as well. So as I mentioned, um, this was a big project with many components last year and where it's ongoing as we're gonna be looking at carryover effects specifically on bud fruitfulness or the amount of clusters per shoot in these vines as well as uh, early season growth. And then uh, this current season in 2020, we're also gonna be expanding upon this project and looking at other lantern flight densities and really try to get at um, what 
level of lanternflies, grapevines can tolerate and withstand. So a big shout out to everyone involved. This was a big project that required many hands. Um, and I appreciate uh, all the work that people did on this. And I'll take any questions if anyone has any. Thanks, Drew. Um, great job. You're actually getting a fair number of questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. So if you wouldn't mind um, stopping to share your screen and then maybe you can take those questions um, offline with those folks. And then our next speaker will be Ann Johnson, who's with Penn State, and she'll be talking about spotted lanternfly um, and its development related to Tree of Heaven. So take it away, Ann. Hello. Um, can everyone hear me? Yep, can hear you great. Awesome. Uh, so, as uh, Heather just said, I'm going to be talking about spotted lanternfly development and reproduction without access to Tree of Heaven. Um, we've gone over the basics of spotted lanternfly uh, pretty repeatedly today, so I assure you don't need another overview of that. But I will just remind you that uh, spotted lanternfly does have a strong affiliation with Tree of Heaven. Um, some people had previously thought that it may be a required host for them, um, despite their large polyvagus uh, range. And as such, Tree of Heaven removal has been recommended as a control measure. Um, however, there were previous reports of spotted lanternfly surviving to adulthood without access to Tree of Heaven. And as you'll see from this uh, study that we did, um, they actually are able to both survive and off a posit without um, access to that Tree of Heaven. So that was actually the main question we were trying to answer was, does spotted lanternfly actually need Tree of Heaven to complete its life cycle from nymphs to adult and to reproduce? And then we're also sort of secondarily looking at what are some potential uh, host preferences that spotted lanternfly may have throughout their life cycle. Um, so our methods were, uh, we planted a whole bunch of trees and set up 10 enclosures around them. Uh, in each of the enclosures, the spotted lanternfly nymphs would have had access to silver maple and weeping willow. And then in five of the cages, there was Tree of Heaven, and in the other five, there was River Birch in place of Tree of Heaven. We also attempted to plant black walnut in these cages, but unfortunately, uh, those did not survive. Uh, we then released 355 first instar spotted lanternflies into each of the cages starting on May 23rd. Um, we then went back each week and recorded their survival, uh, what life stage they had reached, and then uh, either their location, meaning which of the plants, either the trees we had planted they were on, or say the cage wall or uh, some of the ground cover. Uh, we left the cages in place until the spotted lantern flies were killed by a frost, which came in early November. So, uh, the first of our results were for their survival. Um, we actually found no significant difference between the survival of the spotted lanternfly in the cages with a lanthus and without a lanthus. Um, you can kind of see where they went back and forth, and um, the reason our survival sort of went up sometimes was sometimes we would be able to find more that we weren't able to find the previous week. Um, but all in all, they, there was no significant difference uh, between how many survived. Where there was a difference was in their development. We found that the spotted lanternflies without access to um, Tree of Heaven actually developed about a week later uh, to adulthood than those who did have access to Tree of Heaven. Um, and there was also potentially because of that difference in development, a uh, difference in the um, number of egg masses that were laid. Um, the spotted lanternflies who did not have uh, access to that tree of heaven uh, only ended up laying six egg masses total by the end, whereas those who did have access to tree of heaven laid uh, many, many more. Uh, it may be worth noting that um, it did appear at the time that that frost came and killed them off that um, there were some very well-developed females who were potentially gravid. Um, so perhaps if that frost had not come, they would have been able to equal the number of egg masses laid. Um, but we are looking more into that uh, later on. For the host preferences, this was a bit harder to tell because even though we could sort of see which um, plants they were on, we did not necessarily know 
uh, whether or not they were feeding. But um, for the proportions uh, of the spotted lanternfly nymphs that were in the cages, um, that were in the cages with Tree of Heaven in them, um, the, the greatest uh, proportion was found on that Tree of Heaven for the nymphs. Um, in cages uh, without access to that Tree of Heaven, there was actually no significant difference between uh, the plants with the two highest proportions, which were the weeping willow and the silver maple. Um, for the adults, um, you, there was actually no difference between silver, or no significant difference between silver maple and tree of heaven uh, in the cages where they had access to that tree of heaven, um, whereas in the cages where they did not have access to tree of heaven, uh, the largest proportion were on that uh, silver maple. So uh, basically the most interesting part of this is that we now know that spotted lanternfly can both reach adulthood and uh, oviposit without access to Tree of Heaven, which has uh, lots of implications for management and dispersal. This means that you can't just remove Tree of Heaven and stop uh, spotted lanternfly populations as well. And it also means that spotted lanternfly could potentially disperse into locations where Tree of Heaven is not uh, currently present. Also, uh, since development was slowed, uh, that has other implications for management. Potentially, Tree of Heaven, uh, since it has these fitness effects and does mean that there is a longer period when the nymphs are, um, you know, vulnerable to death from things like natural enemies or environmental conditions, and before they can reproduce, there could be a lowering in the populations um, without access to Tree of Heaven. Uh, we would just need to look some more at that. And also, uh, what I'm sort of looking at now, potentially they may be actually sequestering toxins from some of these trees, which could offer them uh, some protection to natural enemies, which they would no longer be getting uh, if there was no more Tree of Heaven. We're also waiting to find out if there were any effects on um, how many, say, what proportion of those eggs that were produced by um, those spotted lanternflies without access to Tree of Heaven, um, it, if there were any effect on how many actually were able to uh, hatch up, and also sort of what effects may be uh, present further down the line. And uh, we also would like to note that our trees are very small so that they could fit inside the enclosure. So uh, that development difference may have to do with tree size and nutrition. For example, if they were able to feed on a larger plant that had sort of a better sap flow and nutrition, um, perhaps they could have equaled the development of those who had access to Tree of Heaven. Also, some of our host preference may have been affected by the fact that uh, trees like Alanthus messes earlier. So when we got those adults moving to um, the silver maple, potentially that is because Alanthus really wasn't producing uh, the necessary um, amount of sap to allow for proper nutrition on the spotted lantern. Sorry. So we had a lot of people to thank for this project. Um, definitely couldn't have done it without everyone you see listed here and many others. So I guess I'll be taking any questions now. Got about five minutes, it looks like. All right. Thanks so much, Anne. Great job. Um, we have one question on uh, whether or not the egg masses that came uh, uh, from adults without Alanthus are viable egg masses. So um, we're still waiting to find that out. Um, hopefully they'll start hatching out soon. Okay, great. Um, and then Julie has a question for you. Do you think that if the trees were more established in the enclosures, would you be able to offset the developmental differences that you saw? I think that it certainly would have an effect because if they were more established and sort of a better nutritional source, 
um, it may be that uh, that nutrition is what's actually important since Tree of Heaven produces uh, uh, a lot of sap flow, um, allowing the spotted lanternflies to sort of feed very well on them. Um, if there were better established trees that were maybe able to produce sort of equal amounts, then that definitely I feel like could have an effect on uh, sort of offsetting those de developmental differences. Right, okay. And then Greg wants to know, what was the total number of egg masses between the two groups? Um, let me go back and check. It was... Sorry. No, no worries. Yeah. Um, it, it, while you're looking that up, um, Kelly did um, make a note here that um, they're going to be running the same experiment again this year, um, and they expect the DBH of those trees to be much greater and, and more established. Hopefully mm -hmm. we can get some data on uh, Julie's question as well. I'm not finding the the total total. Um, it was definitely six for those with Atalanthus. It looks like it might have been uh, probably uh, high 40s, probably maybe 48 uh, with Atalanthus. I don't know if either Kelly or Uyi remembers. Um, 46. 46. Okay, yeah, great. There we go. Um, and then Ed, Ed has a question. Um, in the cage experiments, is anyone measuring those cage effects? Um, are you referring to like the cage effects on the plants or on the insects? That's a good question. Ed, if you want to clarify. And then another question coming in. Sorry, Andrew, get here in the hot seat here. Um, but uh, asking which species um, uh, did spotted lanternfly have access to feed on when they didn't have a lanthus? So when they didn't have a lanthus, it was. Um, the most common was the weeping willow, uh, but there was actually no significant difference between the weeping willow and the silver maple that we saw them feeding on. Okay, great. Um, and another question, um, was the lower egg count uh, caused solely by the slower development, or do you think there's an additional effect of perhaps higher fertility uh, with Alanthus? My inclination, just because of um, when I was looking at these adults and how, um, I mean, they looked really, to me at least, they looked really fat and gravid. Um, I believe Julie was maybe dissecting some of those to see if they actually had mated and were ready to lay eggs. Um, so yes. from what I saw, I... I think that it maybe was more just since they were slower development, they didn't have time to actually lay those eggs, but um, Julie might know better. That I'm working on those dissections, so I'll be able to answer that when I get off Zoom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, thanks for remembering, Ian. Yeah. Okay, great. I don't see any other new questions for you, um, unless there's some more coming in. Um, so there is one other kind of general question, and, and maybe um, Kelly has some comments on this as well. Um, but if total removal of Tree of Heaven um, may or may not impact populations of spotted lanternfly, um, but does the trap tree method or partial removal decrease the population size? And can these findings tell us anything about the effectiveness of the trap tree method? Um, I guess that... Uh, other people may know more about this than me, um, but yeah, Kelly, it looks like just said Joe's studies this year should help us answer that better. Which... Yeah, so yeah, I agree. I think that's a good question, but um, still, yeah, it's still a good looking at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Anne. Appreciate it, and great job on your presentation. Thank you. So, Mariam, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. 
So our next speaker is Miriam Taleb, and she's from Penn State and going to be talking about fungal communities associated with sooty molds. Are you there, Mariam? Oh. I am here, sorry about that, everyone. All right, so, um, hi everyone, I'm Mariam Talib. I'm uh, in Julie Urban's lab, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about some of the earlier data that we have from our sequencing of leaf surfaces on SLF infested Olympus. Let's see if this is still working. Mm. Sorry. So um, we all know that SLF is a voracious feeder, that it can congregate in incredible numbers, that um, part of the damage that it is doing is, is simply the number of, of insects that we can see. And, and what that can mean when they're feeding so heavily is also that there is a large amount of waste. Um, so study mold is sort of what I've been uh, focusing on. A lot of waste uh, will begin to accumulate on leaf surfaces. Um, honeydew will form a sticky surface um, and as the season carries on, that honeydew is utilized as a food source by sooty molds, which are a polyphyletic group of fungi with melanized cell walls that protect it, them from UV exposure and high tolerances uh, to low water activity. What a sooty mold is or isn't, somewhat under debate. Um, as they come to dominate the philosophic community, they can form these thick black mycelial mats, which can block photosynthesis and can actually cause pretty dr um, drastic damage to plant health. Um, and then because honeydew is falling onto surfaces other than plants, this can also cause a lot of homeowner damage. Um, we do know that they, sooty molds can be an allergen. And so we've seen uh, sooty mold accumulation on decking, as you see here, cars, toys, goats, um, anything you name. Um, so there are some con concerns amongst homeowners as well. Um, so as, as Slantronfly came into Pennsylvania, we had some clear first questions about sooty mold that we wanted to sort of investigate. The first is that when Slantronfly hit Korea, uh, that the outbreak um, there of sooty mold was a huge contributor to the economic damage on grapes. So at first we were really bracing for that kind of damage. But as things kind of shook out here, we noticed that that really wasn't happening. And so one of the questions that we do have is, why isn't sooty mold as prevalent in the U.S. invasion? And is that going to continue to shake out as lanternfly expands beyond the mid-Atlantic? Um, the other question that's come up in Pennsylvania in particular, uh, where the timber industry represents about 5.5 billion worth of our GDP, um, is that if it's accumulating on saplings, which are more likely to be hit by sort of photosynthetic capacity being uh, capped. Um, even if though it's not directly a plant pathogen, how is this impacting plant health? And is it enough that we need to be concerned and be looking for mitigation tactics? So Nemo was also just really weird. So from a scientific standpoint, it's a really interesting question to investigate. Um, it's sort of situated in between these plant-insect interactions, but we don't totally understand its relationships to plants or insects. And because lanternfly is prolificous and novel, we have some really interesting ways to investigate some of these questions. Um, so the objectives that we're kind of gonna be touching on today are mostly just, can we identify some candidate sooty mold causing taxa from multiple sources? Can we use this sequencing as a window into um, what's happening uh, in the at the microscopic level when we're starting to see some sooty mold buildup? Um, and so just going a little bit over what these potential relationships could be, the literature tends to say there's no strong relationships between any one taxon of sooty mold and any one plant or insect, but we also see some evidence that the environment is selecting, and that environment could be honeydew composition, microhabitat and humidity, homogeneity of landscapes, and uh, shaping what uh, fungi are available to be colonizing leaves, 
You'll also see some examples of tighter relationships between um, plants, insect pests, and sooty mold species. And so one example of this could be orange and citrus psyllid um, regularly being colonized by Capnodium citri. It's unclear whether that is a good taxonomic definition of a species. Um, and so this is some of the difficulties that we have in, um, in sooty mold and, and in mycology more broadly as well. But with newer technologies, that means that there are newer ways to investigate some of these questions. So the biggest thing is the cost and availability of amplicon sequencing has really changed what we understand sooty mold to potentially be. Um, so I'm going to propose some alternative models really quickly um, there of how there are relationships between sooty mold plant and uh, these plant-insect interactions. The first is this horse to the finish line, whatever uh, capable fungus species reaches the honeydew first is the colonizer. That's the way it works. Um, we'd expect to see totally variable sooty mold taxa on different individual plants. We wouldn't expect to see a ton of patterning across what we uh, across these different species. The al another alternative is this most prepared wind. So it's a tough environment. Um, it's high UV, low water activity, and the honeydew is, um, is going to contain some plant defense chemicals. So maybe there are a lot of potential species and only one is ready for the situation. And then a third alternative is we have a species of sooty mold that's specific to lanternfly. It came with lanternfly or it is in some way finding a type relationship with lanternfly and from there is able to colonize because it's adapted to the waste of lantern. I think our most likely is that there's a little bit of a mix of all of this. Maybe they brought some novel fungi, maybe they didn't. There's still competition going on at different plant surfaces and microhabitats matter. So there's a lot of complexity to this question as well. We're at the beginnings of this. Um, so for this project, what we were doing is swabbing leaf surfaces of SLF invested plants before we ever saw any sooty mold and just sort of investigating as we did see sooty mold growing, making notes on observations of visible sooty mold, what were we seeing reflected in the genetic material? We're gonna focus mostly on the lanthus today. Um, extracted the DNA, amplified the ITS2 gene region, um, used the Illumina Amplicon sequencing platform. Um, we uh, did OTU picking through the charm pipeline um, we hand blast searched on GenBank um, and confirmed all of that taxonomy using MicroBank and, and newer literature. Um, so we have about the top 164 OTUs or operational taxonomic units that we've identified two species as best as we could, um, which is about, represents about the top 80% of total sequences. Um, and this is our sampling location. It was in Berks County in 2017. Um, this is someone's backyard that graciously let us um, sample. So along about 325 feet, we had relatively evenly spaced um, uh, chosen Alanthus and sampled uh, approximately weekly over the course of the season. So here I have um, some of the earlier data. This is the average proportional abundance of genera at each time point. Um, study mold was most visible in weeks six through nine. Um, and of these genera, only Trancomerium, which is the full yellow all the way at the bottom, um, is a known study mold genus. So I have the same graph over again, colored by Trancomerium or study mold versus all of the other species. So Trancomerium in yellow, all other genera are in blue there. Um, I am still sorting through some diversity indices right now, but I will say that there is no significant difference by week in community structure. So take some of this with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, and then sort of a different way to visualize sort of these changes over time. This is just picking the six, uh, the seven most abundant genera um, across the season and visualizing how those changed over time. Um, so here with this orange, uh, line that's trichovarium here um, and it, you can see there's a peak in week seven that is the time when we saw the most uh, sooty mold. Um, interestingly this blue line here with the with the arrow that's Lophiostoma 
um, it seemed to be working in opposition to a lot of the rest of the community on leaf surfaces. And on the samples where we saw a lot of that uh, genus, the communities looked completely different from other samples of those time points. Um, this is sort of early, early PCOA with Bray Curtis dissimilarity indices. We do see some loose clustering with the later weeks, six through nine, where we saw the most visible sooty mold, and the tightest clustering at week seven, where we saw the most sooty mold of any week. So there is some implication that that means potentially these communities are becoming more similar as sooty mold colonizes. Um, there's a little more investigation to be done here. And we are continuing to investigate by plant species. We have a little more data to come here. Um, we do see that they cluster by plant species primarily, and but we do have to kind of dig more through um, how time, how sooty mold observations may correlate to different to differences across these communities. Uh, so some basic takeaways. Uh, first, time does not seem to be a significant factor. It's really possible that this has to do with us not having enough samples that worked very well. Um, we had some learning curve issues with uh, bench work <laughs> for me. Um, so I think we need to go back to those original DNA samples that I do still have and, and kind of uh, start at the beginning and flush out some of what we have. Um, but we also need to just add to this data set. Um, and we also found visible study mold growth was kind of inconsistent across the obvious factors. We did not see it directly linearly grow across all of these plants. I do not highlight which weeks have the most sooty mold, um, but if it rained hard and some plants were out in the open, that might wash some off. And so it, it does become a little bit inconsistent there. And I don't think we have a good idea of what we can use to predict sooty mold growth in any one time. Um, we did find trichomeria was a good candidate for sooty molds found in Tree of Heaven. Um, potentially, this is the environment selecting. Um, it has helped to guide protocols for ongoing isolation studies, which has been very helpful. Uh, we're working with a new modified medium to be growing uh, these fungi on. They can be pretty difficult to, uh, to culture in part because they are such so extremophiles. Um, and there's more data to be analyzed, so there will be more results and maybe more clarity from all of this. Um, and just to kind of broadcast out what the future studies will be, um, we are continuing work on identifying study molds, so working to finish the analysis on the other three plant species from this year and mapping these data to uh, collected weather and study mold observation data. Um, we also hope to repeat this a little bit with additional years of sampling, and now that the habitats are broadening as lanternfly spreads, I think adding to that information too will be very helpful in understanding where these um, sources of anophthalm really are coming from um, and continuing to try to isolate from samples. Um, sort of next up, I'll be working on, I was hoping to do that this year, but uh, you know, sometimes plans change considering everything. Um, so I'll be working on applying collected and false honeydew to maple saplings with or without an additional sooty mold slurry um, and investigating some plant health metrics and photosynthetic impacts and plant defense changes to kind of get at we have a lot of concern about forestry and saplings. Um, how much of it is warranted? Where do we want to set an economic threshold and what kind of mitigation tactics we want to start to recommend? But I'll be miles from those questions, but at the starting point. I yeah, just want to thank everybody who helped out with all the data collection, analyses, everything, um, and the Cole family for letting us use their backyard so intensively, um, which is a beautiful place to work. So that concludes me. Any questions? Thanks, Mariam. Great job. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen so that Mike is able to get his presentation loaded up while I ask you questions. Um, mm -hmm. So Emily has a question about, do we know if any accounts of sooty molds, either from SLF or maybe any other um, large amount of sooty mold, causes allergic reactions in people or animals? Yes. Uh, so there is evidence of like uh, allergic reactions in part from the sooty mold directly and in part because it can uh, collect uh, environmental uh, pollutants. Um, it's a, sort of a stickier surface, and so there's been some evidence of, of various uh, human health impacts. Uh, animals, I'm not totally sure. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. That's all the time we have for questions uh, now, but you do have a couple others if you'd like to take those um, offline.
And our next speaker is Mike Wolfen um, with Penn State, and he'll be talking about flight capabilities of Audubon. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm a postdoc in Tom Baker's lab, and I'm an insect behaviorist, and I'm really interested in uh, answering mechanistic questions on, of the flight dispersal of the spotted lanternfly. Uh, so I'm, I plan to go long, uh, so I want to thank everybody first, and if I to cut some results or data, I'm going to do that. Um, so as everybody knows, uh, you've seen this a zillion times, but the spotted lanternfly are dispersing uh, very, very quickly, and like I said earlier, we want to um, mechanistically understand how they are progressing um, the way they are. As insect behaviorists, everything starts with observations. Uh, here's a video from 2017 of mass dispersal flights, uh, insects just flying in very, very high numbers um, in the field. Another observation that sparked our interest was that early season adult females were um, smaller uh, and we define early season females as like August and late September, August through late September, compared to um, the late season adult females that we find in October, but also in, in late September also. Um, and that sparked our research questions. Um, we wanted to uh, describe these uh, females that were uh, flight dispersing. Uh, we want to know if there are uh, we wanted to understand the morphological and physiological differences between the flying females from the sedentary females <clears throat> that we see early in the season and late in the season. Uh, we also want to know the mating status of these females um, because uh, that could be really important in terms of identifying the potential threat of these flying females. Uh, we published this because I'm going to fly through this. Uh, we published this uh, in 2019. So uh, here's the reference in case anybody wants to take a look at it. Another research question we wanted to answer is uh, how far can the spotted lantern flies disperse? Um, how far do they fly in the field? And how far can they fly in under controlled conditions? Um, so I'm gonna jump right into it here. Here's one of our field sites to answer this uh, question about are the dispersing spotted lantern flies different from the sedentary ones? Our um, uh, field site had an apple orchard, a wood row, a grape vineyard, and uh, some oak um, in the top left there, and uh, also a telephone pole, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And uh, what we did was we collected flying adults at different points in the season at, uh, when they were flying from the different plants. So for instance, we would stand at the grape vineyard and collect the, the uh, lantern flies as they flew from the wood row. And we recorded the, the minimum distance that they flew. So for instance, um, a spotted lantern fly flying from the wood row and we captured them here, it's about 10 meters. Uh, lantern flies flying from grape to apple and back and back, um, that's about 28 meters. So these are two different uh, types of uh, flights that we characterized. Uh, flying from the wood row to the grape, the minimum flight distance is 30 meters, 18 meters from wood row to apple orchard, etc. Um, we also collected mating pairs when we were here because we uh, wanted to take data on them, and we preserved all of our samples and alcohol for a future um, study. Uh, we also looked at sedentary or poor flyers, um, and this is our field site. It contained a wood row that had Alanthus in it, as well as some maple trees here by our, um, uh, by the office and lab where I was doing my research out in uh, Allentown. Uh, so we located uh, spotted lanternfly adults late in the season. I observed them for 15 minutes to uh, see whether or not they will take flight. And those that were sedentary uh, were uh, sort of gently manually launched into the air to see if they could fly. The flight distances were recorded and the samples were pre preserved in alcohol for later analysis. Um, so these samples that were preserved in alcohol, we took a whole bunch of measurements on them, we weighed them uh, after we allowed them some time to, to uh, dry. Um, we measured their abdominal length with the yellow area that they had and also the wing area to see if maybe there was uh, some difference and maybe some were, could fly well and or poorly based on uh, differences in the wing shape. We also dissected the samples 
to determine their mating status. And we compare, compared these distances, uh, we compared these characteristics to the flight distances. This is the graph I'm gonna show. Um, you can see that apple to oak, apple to ailanthus, apple to grape, all these plants, uh, these were uh, uh, the individuals that were collected while flying. Uh, these are the sedentary individuals, so they were collected on grape, on apple, and on ailanthus. And on the y-axis is, um, is what we measured. Here are the flight distances, again, that I showed from the, um, th these are from what I showed in the, in the uh, field site. And these were measured based on uh, launched, when we, when we tossed them up to see if they could fly. So you can already see that there is a big difference between um, the individuals that we were spontaneously flying compared to the individuals that we uh, manually launched. And um, the take home here is that our observations were correct, you know, were accurate, that the uh, individuals that were flying were lighter than the, than the late season individuals um, that did not fly very well. That's something that we saw with our eyes. And the grand mean support that as well. Um, the good flyers uh, weighed less than the poor flyers. Uh, when looking at wing area, uh, the, the wing area was not um, attributable to the difference in whether or not they could fly. The wing areas were uh, the same um, across the good flyers and the poor flyers. Uh, in terms of abdominal length, the good flyers uh, had shorter abdomens than the poor flyers did. And in terms of abdominal width, again, the good flyers had narrower abdomens than the poor flyers did. So uh, again, we're getting at this, the, the good flyers earlier in the season are just smaller than the poor flyers later in the season. And as we've all seen before, and we just wanted to put a measure on it, the poor flyers had significantly more yellow area on their abdomens uh, than the good flyers did. And um, these are all really good characteristics, but getting to, to the meat of it here, we wanted to know if the dispersing females um, have mated. So we did dissections of, of the mating pairs and we found spermatophores. Um, this is, this is the, the structure that we found the spermatophore in. Uh, we also found these, what we're calling fragile spermatophores um, in, the, in our samples. Uh, we counted the fragile spermatophores uh, just the same as these uh, hardened spermatophores in the females. We dissected all of the insects that we um, tested, and we found that only 5% of the sp flying spotted lanternflies uh, were mated, so that means 95% of them were unmated, and that's significantly fewer, uh, a lower percentage of, of mating uh, than the stationary um, spotted lanternflies, whether they're on Atlantis maple or grape, uh, it's, it's, this, is, this is a good number to see that only 5% of these uh, lanternflies were mated. We looked, and, that, and that's an N of, of only five individuals, by the way. Um, and we looked at all the characteristics of the unmated good flyers compared to the mated good flyers, and uh, there were no differences in these unmated good flyers compared to uh, the mated good flyers, not in weight, yellow area, abdominal area, anything like that. They looked just like um, the mated, uh, the unmated good flyers look just like the mated good flyers. Um, so just to, to look at, wrap this up really quickly. Um, yes, the, uh, earlier in the season individuals are significantly smaller, uh, than the late season sedentary individuals. Uh, and very interestingly, 95 of the dispersing, dispersing of the flying spotted lantern fly, uh, were unmated. So then it begs the question, um, how far can these uh, spotted lantern flies disperse? Uh, and how far do they do it in the field? And experimentally, how long or far can they fly? Um, so in order to address this, we went back to our field sites again. Um, here, and just for a frame of reference, we, um, we did uh, field observations. We observed the individuals flying from the wood row to the vineyard and back. Um, and we also observed within, and we observed within uh, the vineyard uh, flights. So we were, we're trying to see um, how these individuals progress wherever they're going. Uh, we wanted to characterize the flights. So whether it was within the, within the vineyard, within the same plant, or flying to and from a different plant, we wanted to know how they get there. 
Um, and we also did this ex uh, with a little bit more experimental. Uh, we also did this experimentally a little bit differently uh, with, spontane uh, with spontaneous flight. So we put a ring stand out in the middle of a parking lot and we observed the insects taking flight. And we also manually launched them from that same spot to observe, um, again, how they progress, where they go, how they go, how long they fly, how far they fly, that sort of thing. Uh, we measured uh, their flight duration and their distance. So how long and far do they fly? Uh, well, we found that um, when flying within the rows of grapes, so here, uh, the individuals fly for about two seconds, they launch themselves, they fly for a little bit, and then they land. Uh, same things with the grape back to the woods. Um, they're, they're flying from the very front of the uh, vineyard. There aren't flights coming from uh, the back of the vineyard. They're only flying for about four seconds. Interestingly, um, when we launched, the, uh, when we observed them from the ring stand, they were flying uh, for a longer time. And also when we launched them manually, they were flying for a longer time. Uh, we did find that spontaneous flights uh, were about the same in duration and distance as the manually launched flights. In case somebody had that question earlier about, well, you toss them, how do you know that, that they'll take flight? Uh, the, the flight's about the same. Uh, so what we, what we took away here is that um, if there is something to land on, so in the vineyard and the wood row, they do, but in the lack of that stimuli, they will fly until they find something. So for instance, uh, in this um, field site, we have, there, there are trees that are far away from the ring stand, there's lamp posts, garbage cans, et cetera, and they were landing on everything. Uh, so we, we took away that the insects are quickly stimulated to land on nearby objects. We wanna know how far they can fly under even more experimental conditions. So I did observations, um, of spotted lanternfly in, in a lab. Here I've got a fan to provide an airspeed for them. I recorded them. Here's a spotted lanternfly. It was tethered, so it's not flying anywhere. Uh, but I wanted to record how many bouts this lanternfly can fly and how long spotted lanternflies can fly. And uh, this is just the first um, trial. And it took me around two hours uh, to do. This assay took far too long. Um, so we limited it to 10 bouts of unlimited duration to try to see uh, how many, uh, so for instance, here they flew more than 50 bouts of averaging one minute uh, per bout. I gave them a minute of rest. So um, it, it, it took far too long. So when uh, we gave them bouts of unlimited duration, um, the insects were able to fly 10 bouts, um, still averaging a minute long. Um, and there's no significant differences in the flight bouts uh, from one and 10, so they can go for much longer, uh, conceivably 50 bouts. Um, when we look at it, and there's a couple more uh, trials in here that I included for various reasons, we saw that they can fly uh, for close to 800 seconds, 750 seconds. These insects can fly uh, if they're not prompted to land for a very long time. So um, what we saw was even though they're capable of bouts of around 300 seconds, uh, the typical dispersal flights are between two and four seconds and they're attracted to vertical objects. And uh, that's interesting because as I pointed out, there's this telephone pole here in the middle of the vineyard and the insects uh, accumulate on this telephone pole in massive, massive numbers. You can see here that they land on this telephone pole and they um, insert their stylets, so they're sampling from it. And future studies this season, uh, we're going to try to uh, figure out, can we use telephone poles to get an accurate measure of, um, to, get a, um, uh, to, to, to get an accurate number of how many lanternflies they're in it and use it as a, as a behavioral trap. Um, and I think with that, I, I'm done. If I can answer one question, if we got to move, we got to move. Yeah, no, I think we have time for our questions. Um, so one coming in, are flight directions generally driven by a specific agenda um, or is the dispersal flight via more of a random walk? 
Um, agenda is a, is a word that I, I wouldn't use. Um, but uh, yeah, they seem to be flying upwind. So they're, they're, uh, they launched themselves, and I didn't mention this, but they launched themselves upwind, uh, which is why in the flight tunnel assays, uh, not the flight tunnel assays, in the laboratory assays, um, the insects would not fly, would not flap their wings unless wind was present. And they did launch from a platform um, into the wind. So they're, they're progressing upwind both okay. in our field observations and in the, and this was reinforced by the lab assays. All right, thanks very much, Mike. We're running out of time. Um, and so if you could stop sharing and then allow Lauren yeah. to um, go next, all right. So up next is Lauren Briggs from Penn State and she'll be talking about overposition preference and spatial distribution. Okay, uh, can you see this and hear me? Yep, all looks great. Okay, great. Um, my name is Lauren Briggs and um, I work in the Centenari Lab at Penn State. And um, I had the opportunity to work on this project with Heather Leach, also from Penn State. Um, and we, we were looking into, like many of the other people here, uh, spotted lantern fly over position. Um, you know, there are a lot of really curious behaviors we start to notice at the end of the season when they start laying eggs and um, we, we had some specific observations that we, um, we designed some little projects to try and tease out. Um, so one of, the, one of these observations was these clusters of egg masses. Um, this was a really extreme example that got our curiosity really peaked. Um, you know, there are these maple trees and plenty of seemingly suitable branches and you can just see these clusters of egg masses like on top of each other on one specific side of this one branch. And um, so this got us wondering like why, why is this happening? Is this happening on purpose? Um, you know, what are some of these mechanisms? Um, and then we also started wondering about the substrates. Um, there's a lot of conjecture about what spotted lanternfly like to lay eggs on. Um, you know, you hear rusty metal is like a popular choice for them, one of their preferences. Um, so we, we thought this was an interesting question too. So um, um, this, these, these observations led us to develop two basic questions that we thought maybe we could gather some preliminary data on um, that might, you know, lead us in a direction. So um, the first question was, do spotted lanternfly have a preferred substrate to lay eggs on? And then the second question we developed was, do they prefer to lay their egg masses near other egg masses? Ultimately, um, the goal of this, this research would be to inform management tools. You know, hopefully, you know, we could figure out some of their preferences and be able to, um, you know, maybe design some kind of substrate that would be their number one choice and we could pull egg masses, you know, maybe out of the vineyard onto this one substrate so they would be easier to manage or something like that in the future. Um, so the first study we designed to, um, to start to address these questions, um, the first study was about the substrates. Uh, we found pieces of different materials based on what we had seen in the field and what other people had been saying they saw egg masses laid on. So um, we used wood, both rough and smooth wood. We used plastic, black and white, thinking, you know, maybe black would get warmer in the sun or something like that and be more attractive. Um, we used clean metal and rusty metal and concrete. And we put them in two different orientations as well. So we had, you know, a horizontal and a vertical. You can see in those photos, the top, those are the vertical and then in the bottom, those are a couple of the horizontal. So um, our hope was that having these different variations, you know, in the color and the texture of these materials would maybe help us flesh out some of the preferences um, and maybe give us clues as to the reasoning, you know, why they chose these certain substrates. And we placed them in the vineyard, a vineyard that had a pretty high population of spotted lanternfly during the overposition period. Um, you can see in these photos, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but at the bottom of the screen here, all these black specks in the row are 
uh, dead spotted lanternfly that had been sprayed. Um, and the first week I was scouting, there were, you know, 100 or so on some of the vines that I counted. So, um, <laughs> but unfortunately, maybe the most interesting result that we, we got was that um, they all left, you know, <laughs> they just, they were gone. The following week, you know, after I counted about 100 on some of the vines, the next week, I was counting mostly zeros, maybe a couple ones. So, and that's something someone mentioned in a previous presentation as well, this kind of dispersal tendency. Um, so we got a total of four egg masses laid across all of our different substrates and replications. Um, so we weren't able to determine any statistical significance, um, you know, since we had such a small sample size. But maybe something interesting to note is that they, um, the spotted lanternfly only laid eggs on the underside of those horizontal surfaces. Um, so that was that study. Um, then our second study that we designed to address the question of this kind of clustering or clumping effect of the egg masses, um, this we had, we had a really, um, we had a good opportunity with one of the vineyards we were working with um, where we were able to collect some of the egg masses, um, egg masses on pieces of bark. So we collected 13 pieces of bark with an egg mass on it and then 13 pieces of just plain bark of equal size. And we placed these pieces of bark on a two by six plank 13 two, two by six planks, um, secured them with glue or staples or, you know, whatever made them stay. And then we propped them up against trunks of vines in a vineyard that had a nice, a nice population of spotted lantern fly during the oviposition period. Um, and uh, we, we, the position of the egg mass relative to the ground was randomized. So we had a mixture of egg mass in that up position, the blue position and in the down position of the green. Um, and this maybe is a better way to visualize what our, our planks look like. You can see on, you know, you can see the egg mass in the center of these pieces of bark and then the plain pieces of bark on the opposing end. Um, and I'll zoom into these so you can see what happened. When the egg mass was in the down position, um, we had very few egg masses laid. I highlighted in red the egg masses that were the original ones placed on the planks by us. Um, and then in purple, you'll see the egg masses that were laid on the boards during this period of time they were set up in the vineyards. And you know, you can see there are a few and they're kind of scattered about. But um, when the egg mass was in the up position, um, you can see we had a few on the side of the board that was down. Um, and then I've highlighted in red the original egg masses. And then in purple, those are all of the egg masses that were laid after we placed these boards up. Um, so it was, <laughs> it was surprising that we, um, that we got this response. And um, the way we analyzed this data was using this kind of target approach. We, we split it up into zones basically. So, you know, five centimeters, 10 centimeters and 15 centimeters out from the original piece of, you know, bark or bark with egg mass. And what we analyzed was just number of egg masses in that zone. Um, and you can see that at each one of these distances, there was a significant difference between, the, you know, there were significantly more egg masses laid near the piece of bark with the egg mass on it. Um, an interesting question that still remains for me about this, well, I guess there are a lot of questions that remain, but one that I'm very curious about is why there were so many more when the egg mass was in the up position. I mean, the up position was closer to the trunk of the grapevine where the spotted lanternfly were. So, you know, teasing out that mechanism, like how did they find that egg mass? What attracted them to it? Why was it more attractive when it was closer? I think would be a really interesting question to try and address. Um, so to summarize our conclusions, um, we did find that spotted lanternfly were more likely to lay an egg mass near an existing egg mass 
we also, you know, in our substrate study, we only saw IGMASs laid on the underside of the horizontal orientation. So, you know, maybe this could be an indication that they prefer to lay eggs in a somewhat protected area. And that, that would, you know, correspond to a lot of the things we see in the field. But we would need to do another round of that study. And we hope to this year to get some meaningful results statistically. And um, hopefully we can continue for future research also to develop these ideas further and learn more about their behavior and more about their overposition preferences so that eventually they could be a tool for management, whether that's in vineyards, um, you know, as a way to pull egg masses to one place to manage them, or, you know, maybe as a tool that we could use to search for egg masses in places where they're being newly detected or, you know, something like that. Um, and I guess that's it. Yeah, thank you to everyone who helped with this project, the, the very generous vineyards that allowed us, that hosted these projects, and um, thank you to everyone for listening. All right, thanks so much, Lauren. Great job. Um, I'm not seeing any questions come in on the chat or the Q&A, unless, Julie, you have seen some. No, I haven't yet. I just wondered um, what your plans were going to be for this year, if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Yeah, this year we were hoping to, um, to do the same study with the substrates again um, and hopefully get more egg masses laid on the substrates so we could really see if there was a preference. And also, when, um, what was the timing about, like, what was the time frame when you saw the eggs being laid? Um, when was that? We, um, I think it was October that we put those in. We had them, or mid, I'm having trouble remembering. <laughs> I think it was, yeah, <laughs> early, was... early October through the, the end of the month, so it was pretty late. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and then uh, Kelly asked for a clarification on what um, it means to have an egg mass on the up versus down position. Um, just with our experimental design, we had the post, you know, if this was the trunk and this was our two by six plank, we had, you know, the egg mass would either be here or here and, you know, vice versa. So up was, you know, further away from the ground and slightly closer to the trunk of the tree just because of the, the angle of the plank. Great, thanks. And then Rick has um, a question, uh, maybe slash comment. Um, is, egg, is laying an egg mass near uh, other egg masses possibly an adaptation to reduce parasitism by overwhelming the functional response of the parasites? If so, it would suggest that parasitism is a major mortality factor in Asia. Yeah, that's a really nice comment. I think it, I mean, I think it would be interesting. It could be, you know, a direction that this could go if we could learn more about the behavior and the reasons why. Okay, great. And then Tom, you have a question you want to ask? Yeah, I thought it was a great presentation. It's really, really interesting. So it was a good job. Yeah, I think uh, the mating, I think it, given that it looks like these mated females have to walk to where they lay their eggs, they're not kind of flying in there. They, um, and the mating pairs we've seen in the field um, are on these, um, vertical surfaces, on Alanthus trunks uh, and everywhere. It seems to me that it would be interesting to know, um, you know, after they mate, you know, how they do walk. You know, most of these guys, as you know, they walk up. Um, but what, what makes them stop, given that they're already on that uh, grape post or the telephone pole, uh, you showed some nice pictures, um, the behavior being able, it's really tough to find a uh, female that has just recently made it on that surface and then see how she walks and where she stops. But it looks like they do walk up from your data and they get to a, a horizontal um, position like a scaffold branch. We all saw those in the maple trees at that church, the pictures and uh, so yes, you're right. The behavior um, is the key to uh, how they deposit their eggs. But it does look like it was really cool. They stop and lay eggs where they sense another egg mass already. So nice job. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that comment.
Thanks, Tom. And then we'll give you one more question from Sarah. Um, she says, do you think that a complex stem or canopy structure would likely be correlated with higher egg mass site suitability um, because you have more sheltered locations? I think it could be. And I think that would be um, a really interesting question to try and, um, to try and address. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much, Lauren. Great job. Um, and uh, now is our lunch break. Um, and so we will resume uh, the rest of the talks at one o'clock. A lot of the um, people who are attending can't see it, but our peak attendance so far has been 195 people. So this is great interest. And so we're going to kick it off with our first talk by Erica Smyers from Penn State. Take it away, Erica. Hello. Uh, let me just set a timer here. Oh, I see. Um, so yeah, hi, my name is Erica Smyers. Um, and as Julie mentioned, I'm her PhD student. And I'm going to be talking about um, a spatial temporal model that we've been developing for spotted lanternfly spring egg hatch um, prediction. And um, a big shout out to Dennis Calvin. He's really helped me with this work a lot. Um, and our other collaborators were Stephen Crawford um, Andrew, and also Andrew and Doug Pfeiffer um, from Virginia Tech. So um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but um, uh, as many of you already know, uh, many factors can influence insect developmental rates. Um, and some examples of abiotic or climatic uh, variables would be humidity, uh, light and uh, photo period and also temperature. Um, however, um, temperature is, is very commonly used to model um, developmental rates of insects um, because they are reliant on um, the heat in their environment in order to um, grow and develop. Uh, and for every species, they have a minimum or base temperature threshold, or T0, and uh, they have a maximum temperature threshold. And this means that if uh, temperatures fall below the minimum or above the maximum, the insect's development can be slowed or arrested. And um, in order to achieve a specific physiological event, say egg hatch, um, the insect needs to acquire a certain amount of heat from the environment. And one way of indexing this summation of heat is with a uh, degree day. And one very common method for computing a degree day is an averaging method where you take the um, daily maximum temperature and the minimum temperature, and you divide it by two, and you subtract the base threshold or minimum temperature threshold. And if we know their thermal thresholds and de uh, their um, degree day requirements, we can actually predict their seasonal occurrence and uh, this can help guide our pest management, management decisions. So in Korea, Choi and Park studied the um, developmental rates of SLF egg hatch um, using constant temperature studies. Um, but we know that these uh, species specific thresholds can be different, not only between species, but within species due to environmental constraints and geographic location, et cetera. So we want to know uh, how are uh, Pennsylvania populations going to compare and how does this affect our phenology predictions? So the goals of our study were to estimate, um, number one, estimate a temperature, um, a base temperature or T0 for Pennsylvania populations. Uh, next was to compare Pennsylvania and Korea populations and develop develop prediction models, and then third, to test and validate these prediction models. So um, this past year, I've been conducting constant temperature experiments, 
Um, and these were based upon egg masses from Leesport, Pennsylvania that were collected in January of uh, this, this past year. And um, the constant temperature treatments were intended to be at 20, 24, 25, 27, and 30 Celsius. And we used uh, personal incubation chambers with data loggers and a 16-8 photo period. Um, and we did 30 egg masses per temperature treatment and they were placed in these petri dishes. And every day hatch counts were recorded and the mean duration to hatch or um, days was recorded. So you can estimate the base temperature um, or T0 by doing a linear regression um, where um, the parameter estimates are derived by uh, taking Y, which is one over days and you extrapolate it to zero. And then uh, T0 is the temperature and um, the lower base temperature for development, T0 is equal to uh, minus alpha over beta, and the reciprocal of the slope is one over beta, and that's essentially the thermal constant, or K. So, um, to generate the hatch prediction equations, um, you can use degree days to uh, determine the cumulative proportion hatch. Um, and this is where um, PC is the proportion to completion of the egg stage. And the carrying capacity is one. Um, and then uh, you have your alpha and beta uh, parameter estimates, and then the ADD is the accumulated degree days. So back in 2017, I did a field study where I documented uh, field hatch in Ole, Pennsylvania. Um, and basically it was a homeowner's property um, I went through in December and marked a bunch of egg masses there, put out data loggers. And you can actually see where PDA had been banding these Atlantis trees. So I, I chose that site. And um, on an almost daily basis, um, beginning from April through June, um, I basically documented the hatch frequencies. And here's an example of uh, one of the sets of egg masses hatching out. And um, in addition to this field study, um, Doug Pfeiffer's group also shared some of their um, observed field hatch um, with us so we could validate our models. So in terms of the results for the constant temperature studies, um, so the 20, the 24, 25, 27, these are the intended temperature set points. And the ones in the parentheses are the actual readout temperatures. Um, and the 30 Celsius, nothing hatched out at that temperature, but the loggers reported um, some inconsistencies there. So um, that temperature was excluded from the analysis. And you can see here that as the temperature increased, uh, the duration or days to hatch uh, decreased. And generally speaking, the survival rate um, was much higher at lower temperatures. And as temperatures increased, uh, the survival rate decreased. And um, here's a table. There's a lot of numbers going on here, but Basically, these are the linear regression relationships between constant temperature and rate of development, um, or one over days for um, the Choi and Park studies, but also my studies. And the asterisk just means that um, that was where regression was performed with one of the outliers being excluded. 
And then we also um, did combinations of the different, uh, the Choi, Park, and my studies um, to generate some other estimations for, um, or average equation for uh, a base temperature. And as you can see, um, from the R squared, a lot of them had really good fits, but given the degrees of freedom um, and the p-values and f-values for, for these different um, theoretical base temperatures, the Choi and Park and Smyers combination appear to be uh, one of the best models. So this is how the graph would look. Um, with the 95% prediction bands. And these are, um, my data points are the triangles here, and then the circles are park and Choi is the diamonds. And all the data points fall within this average um, linear regression line, um, except for one of my data points, which is the outlier that I'm speaking of, and we excluded that for some of the analysis. So this is how um, some of our prediction models would look like. So this is for the Pennsylvania field study, and using a base temperature of 8.1, um, this is how the, the prediction model would appear when you graph out accumulated degree days versus uh, the cumulative proportion of hatch and the black dots indicate the observed or actual data points and um, to the right we have the base temperature of 12.6 which would have been um, what my uh, constant temperature studies resulted in and as you can see there doesn't really appear to be a significant difference between the two models um, and this was the lowest estimate and the highest estimate for the base temperature. Um, so you can see here that they had pretty good fits and um, they both do a decent job predicting the cumulative proportion hatch. And this is if you um, were to graph out the actual Julian date um, for that year with the cumulative proportion. And again, you can see here that the prediction lines look pretty good. So this is using uh, the data, the occurrence data that Andrew and Doug provided from the Virginia site. And again, the same kind of trend you're seeing um, with the lower base temperature uh, in the highest base temperature estimate, the fits are still pretty good at predicting um, the cumulative proportion hatch. And again, same thing, you can see the lines are pretty well fitting here. So um, in order to validate the use of our Pennsylvania prediction model across a broader scale at different geographic locations, um, if you graph the proportion, the cumulative proportion prediction for the PA model and plot it against that of the VA model, you can actually see a very linear trend line here um, and an R-square value very close to one, indicating that the models are very similar. Um, therefore, um, Basically, you could use the, per, the PA prediction model to um, predict at any geographic location. So the main takeaway conclusion here is that the combined model or average model, which was uh, resulted in a base temperature of 10.2, is uh, what we would recommend for predicting the spring egg hatch of spotted lanternfly. And um, how this information will be used is that it will be used in like pest watch, um, pest forecasting uh, software where growers can go in and be able to tell uh, in terms of over time like what the proportion of 
egg hatch is going to be in their location. And then they can plan their pest management strategies accordingly. And with that, I have a lot of people to thank you. Um, all these people were involved in these early studies. Um, and thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. Um, so we have uh, a question from Ann Nielsen. Um, so what was the predicted number of degree days for egg hatch? And so, yeah, maybe while predicted you answer number. that, we can load Devin's presentation. So number, predicted number of degree days for egg hatch. Yeah, let me bring up the chart. Or maybe, how about if we can, um, maybe you can answer that in the chat to Ann. Sure. That would be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Great job, Erica. All right. Um, and then Heather, are you going to share the screen for with Devin? Uh, or, I got or Devin? it. Okay. So our next speaker is Devin Kreitman from Rutgers. Take it away, Devin. Hello. I'm Devin Kreitman. I'm a PhD student at Rutgers University. I'll be presenting uh, my research I did last summer on nymphal spotted lanternfly responses to temperature. I would like to, before I begin, I would like to thank my co-authors, Dr. George Hamilton, Dr. Ann Nielsen, and Dr. Melanie Kina. Okay, so here we have a fourth instar spiral lanternfly, and we, the first two fourth instars were our main subjects for this, looking at the response to temperature, and their main host is Ilanthus which in order to rear them, we need to provide them with a lot of Ilanthus. And here's some sample pictures of them. So the importance of temperature, so temperature influences the insect's growth rate. So the more tem below its lower threshold, which is its minimum development rate, it can't grow, but once it's above the, the cumulative amount of degrees per day leads to its growth. So you can measure that as degree days. So this can be used to model its activity, its growth based off temperature. So this can also be useful for determining its potential range where it can expand to. It is also useful for predicting when adults start appearing in the field as the adults tend to be the main source of movement. As of now, especially, yeah. Your slides, I just, I don't mean to interrupt, but your slides aren't advancing, so I don't know if you need to advance them or. Uh, which slide are we at? We're still on your title slide right now. Okay, that's not good. Okay, there we Is go. It, all right, so yeah. Full screen doesn't work. Okay, that it's perfect That's like it. this. Yep, you're good. All right, excellent. So this was the image of a fourth install. And here were the images of Ilanthus plants, which are associated hosts. They also have various other hosts. So back to temperature. So it's also useful for timing for when to make applications based off its current life stage. So we looked for experimental setup, we looked at temperatures between 10 degrees Celsius and 35 degrees Celsius at five degree Celsius intervals. For each one of those, we had six tubes. Each of those tubes had 24 sensors given a live potted Ilanthus plant as a host. The plant was watered daily and mortality and molding was recorded. The tubes were stored in an incubator at the respective temperature. And they were given a light photo period of 16.8 light darkness. And the relative humidity was between 60 to 90%. So, Here's an image of the tubes. So we had to make sure there wasn't too much humidity in the tubes as they could drown. So we made sure to have mesh cuttings in it. Here's an image of four sensors, I believe, in tubes on the plant. 
happily feeding. Okay. So for first N stars, uh, we found based on a Briere model, the lower and the lower threshold for development for first N stars was 13.0 plus or minus 0.4 degrees Celsius. And the upper threshold based off the Briere model was 43.8 plus or minus 2.6 degrees Celsius. The linear model estimated the lower threshold to be for first sensors to be 11.5. Uh, the upper threshold for the Briere model is probably inaccurate as preliminary testing at 40 degrees, they weren't doing very well. So it's probably lower than 40 degrees where the upper threshold is. Also, using an upper threshold, uh, I mean, lower threshold of 10 degrees Celsius, the range of cumulative degree days for first installs was found roughly to be 165 to 490 degree days. days. So for their survivability, we found most first insert died in 21 to 35 days at 10 degrees Celsius. Survivability for first insert at 10, I mean 15 to 30 degrees Celsius was similar for first 35 days until an increase in mortality occurred at 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, for second insert, the lower threshold for second insoles was calculated to be 12.4 plus or minus 2.1 degrees Celsius using the Briere model. For the linear model, the lower threshold was 9.3 degrees Celsius. The upper threshold for the second insoles using the Briere model was estimated to be 35.6 plus or minus 0.8 degrees Celsius. And using the lower threshold of 10 degrees Celsius, the range for degree days was found to be roughly 315, 315 to 1,165 days. For their survival, their survivability was very similar at 15 and 35 degrees Celsius while survivability at 20 and 25 degrees Celsius was also similar. For the third instance, the linear model estimated the lower threshold to be 8.4 degrees Celsius. The Briere model wasn't a good fit for the data. And we found using a lower threshold of 10 degrees Celsius, the degree days, the range of degree days for third instance was found to be roughly 525 to 1,865 days. So for third instance, the survivability was similar at for 20, 25, and 30 degrees Celsius. However, it, it, not all the ones at 35 degrees died off very shortly after being reaching that point, suggesting that they might not be that well adapted to higher temperatures as we thought, at least constant exposure. So in summary, for the first instars, the lower threshold was 13 plus or minus 0 0.4 degrees Celsius using the Briere model, and the range for cumulative degree days was 165 to 490 days. For second instars, the lower threshold what using Briere model was 12.4 to 2.1 degrees Celsius, and the upper threshold 
was 35.6 to 0.8 degrees Celsius. The range for cumulative degree days was 315 to 1,165 days. But Thornton stars below threshold was 8.4 degrees Celsius, and the range for cumulative degree days was 525 to 1,865 days. Overall, we also found their range of temperatures that they were adapted, where they seemed adapted to for decrease as they progress. So they seem to be able to be viable at a wider range of temperatures that were forced and saw narrowing with each end star, which makes sense as spring temperatures tend to be more erratic. So for currently, we're working on getting more data for fourth end stars. We, in order to do that, we had to wheel them at 25 degrees Celsius all the way up to fourth. Then once we're at fourth end star, we would move them to respective temperatures so then we could get data. We're also are you going to test it on multiple hosts? So we have the preliminary data for Atlantis and Grape. And we plan on expanding that to red maple and willow. Any questions? Great presentation, Devin. Thank you so much. So we have a question from um, David Binninger. Um, he says, as they get bigger, the base temperature goes down, so they tolerate lower temperatures as they get bigger. Um, he asks, how about establishing upper vertical or horizontal thresholds? Uh, for upper thresholds, we need more data and we need to test higher temperatures. So we, I cannot say for short, certain until we have more temperature points, such as 40 degrees Celsius, but that will come out soon, hopefully. Great. Okay, any, any more questions? Okay, David Bittinger said adults seem to not tolerate high temperatures well. That um, would that would make sense with our preliminary findings. Great. And it was I, I, I really appreciated seeing such the the wide range um uh, as you know the increasing range of of um Degree days uh, across as you got to third in stars. Do you think that some of that might have to do with their diet? Uh, they were all on the same diet at that okay. point. However, the amount per cage was halved each in star, so there should not have been an overwhelming of plants, and they were given new hosts on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. And Devin, I'd also be interested to know, um, you know, in thinking about how strange this spring has been and that there's been a lot of up and downs, um, I'd be curious to know if you're planning on doing anything with um, seeing how how individuals handle heat if they've previously been exposed to kind of um, up and down temperatures, if you will, versus stagnant temperature. That is an interesting question. Uh, I believe there are merits looking into it, but uh, but right now, currently, with currently, I will definitely put that on the to-do list of things to look into and consider. Right. But that is an interesting point. Okay. Awesome. Does anyone else have any other questions for Devin? All right. Well, thank you, Devin. That's an awesome amount of work and some really, um, really useful results. Thank you so much. So since we have like half a minute here, we'll go ahead and, and let Stephanie um, share her screen and get set up here. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk today. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and so I am an applied math postdoc at Temple University, and I'm going to be presenting today about our work, Mathematical Modeling SLF Population Dynamics. This is joint work with Seba Debona, Matthew Helmus, and Benjamin Seibold, and all of us are at Temple. Um, and so I am very, really much, very, sorry, very much looking forward to any sort of thoughts or feedback or suggestions anyone has uh, about how we could make our model better uh, and improve it basically in any way. So uh, thank you. Okay. Okay, so what are our objectives? So what we're doing is developing a simple partial differential equation model, the solutions of which represent total counts of SLF eggs and bugs in a given location. So, uh, we're, so what I'm presenting today is a sort of simplified version of a more complex model that we had been working on and we've been working with this simplified model for the last few weeks or months. So this, this project is still uh, very much in development. Um, and we are, so we are removing the spatial component of dispersion of SLF through the physical landscape. And so once we have a functioning model and a way of studying it, our plan is to fit the functions and parameters to data to compute the reproductive number under a variety of circumstances, right, under different environmental or ecological, biological conditions, to generally predict long-term qualitative qualitative trends and see what might happen to these SLF in the future, um, and then test possible control measures. And so we're working with a combination of both theoretical analysis and numerical simulation here. And today I'll show a little bit for the sake of time of numerical simulation. Okay. So the two quantities that we want to study in this model, as I said, are the total number of SLF eggs and SLF bugs in a given physical spot. So we introduce these functions E and B, which are respectively the total number of eggs of age A at time T and the total number of bugs of age A at time T. And so the variable A here represents developmental age of the bug. And so A has units of degree days and T is just regular old time in units of days. So the first thing we want to think about is what the domain of each of these functions should be. And so here's a little illustration of what the domains of the functions are. So here on the left in lilac, we have a picture of the egg domain. And so because each of them is, is a function of two variables, it's natural to, natural to picture their domains as a rectangle in the 2D AT plane. And so uh, the horizontal axis is the age axis. And the width of the age axis for eggs is, of course, just going to be the, you know, the go from the moment until eggs are laid until they hatch into bugs. And then, of course, the height or of the rectangle um, would just represent the amount of time over which you want to look at a simulation. And then on the right in blue, we have the domain for the bug function B. And analogously, the age axis here would just go from the moment that the eggs hatch into you know, in newborn nymphs, and then on the right here to some, say, hypothetical terminal lifespan of the bugs. And then in the simulations that we look at today, what we'll be looking at is basically horizontal slices um, through these domains. So essentially, like if we fix a time t and look at a horizontal slice, uh, if we look at, sorry, if we look at the function along a horizontal slice, we're looking at the distribution of eggs or bugs at some fixed time. And we're just going to look at a few movies of how that distribution changes over the course of a few years. Okay, so the biological premise and what assumptions are we making? So uh, the approach that we're taking with this model is to first start with a very simple model and to sort of uh, slowly add complications to it to reflect more and more of the nuances of the SLF dynamics. And the first thing that we want to understand is how temperature in particular affects long-term egg and bug population counts. And so we're asking the specific questions, how do temperature dependent development rates dictate population dynamics via the degree day function? And then how significantly does egg and bug death induced by extreme high and low temperatures affect long-term survivability of the population? Okay, so we're thinking about the effect of temperature via development and the degree day function and also death induced by extreme temperatures. 
Okay, and so to really understand how this mechanism of temperature works independent of other aspects of the SLF dynamics, we consider these the effect of temperature first in isolation. So we assume that the eggs and bugs are generally in optimal condition, food is abundant, there's a lack of competition for resources, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And so for the moment, we are neglecting things like background mortality, basal mortality rates, uh, senescence, and then more complicated things like the Ali effect or diapause, et cetera. Um, and when Seba talk, is going to talk more about diapause and how we might include that in his presentation next. Okay, so in terms of the model formulation, so we quantify the effects of temperature in the following functions. So lambda is our degree day function, and we see lambda is a function of capital T temperature, but of course temperature can just be regarded as a function of time. So we can really think of lambda as a function of temperature or as a function of time, uh, depending on the context. And then DE and DB are per capita egg death and egg and bug death rates, respectively, and they also depend on time via temperature. Okay, and so using these functions, we'll look at the explicit forms of them in a second, we can derive the following system of PDEs. So the solutions of which give us our functions E and B. So here we have on the left the time derivatives of E and B, so the rate at which the eggs and bugs are changing is dictated by this first, uh, what's called advection term, which basically acts to mimic bug and egg aging by shifting the eggs and bugs along their respective age axes. And then by this death term, which is a reaction term, and doesn't really move the eggs and bugs along their physical domains, but just acts at each individual spot, decreasing the population based on the death rate. Okay, and so these equations are coupled with an initial distribution of eggs and bugs. So however many eggs and bugs we had at starting time zero of age A, and then a boundary condition, as we say, at, at age A equals zero that gives the rate of egg laying. So this function has this form, where uh, R of A is the age dependent per capita egg laying rate. So basically when you integrate it against the total number of bugs, you get the number of eggs that are being added to the population. Okay, so we'll look quickly at the degree, day, and death functions, and Seba is going to elaborate more on them, but I'll just show you really quickly what they are now. Okay, so for the degree function, we're using the Penn State degree day function, and so uh, when the temperature is below 8.14, we have zero degree day contributions. When it is above 30, we have um, this uh, 21.86 degree day contribution, and then we interpolate linearly in between them. And then uh, to look at the freezing terms, or sorry, the death rate due to freezing for eggs. So we have an optimal temperature range that goes from negative 10 to 27 degrees Celsius. And we assume that there is no death in this region. So this is where something like the, the, the temporary assumption that we're ignoring uh, background mortality would come in. And then when the temperature is above 33 or below Neg or below negative 20, the death rate spikes to one, and then we again just have a linear interpolant on either side in between them. And then the, finally, the death rate for the bugs due to freezing has basically the same shape but with slightly different numbers. So we assume a slightly smaller optimal temperature window going from five to 33 degrees Celsius. Um, and then once we are above 43 degrees Celsius and below zero degrees Celsius, again, we spike up to one, and then again, linearly interpolate in between. Okay, so now let's look at a couple of simulations. And so the, sim things that, well, the situation that we're going to simulate now is what happens to a single clutch of eggs over the course of several years. So you just take one clutch and drop them at some point, um, and then you run the simulations forward and you see what happens. Like, does the population grow? Does the population die out? Et cetera. And we are going to look at uh, run the simulations for four different places. So first, Berks County, and then the Allegheny Forest, and then Northern Virginia, and finally, South Carolina. I'll actually, I, I probably, for the sake of time, I won't show all of them. I'll just show maybe two. Um, okay, so. 
Oh, and we're, we're starting the simulations at January 1st of 2015 every year. Okay. Okay, so here is the, uh, about a, a two minute video of the Berks County simulation. Okay, actually, let me pause and say, okay, so on the left, we have this distribution of eggs along the age axis. And then on the right, we have the distribution of bugs along the age axis. And this yellow rectangle that we have here represents uh, our choice of the reproductive age window in the bugs. And then just as a note, I, I cut off my axis here at four uh, instead of 30. Really this, this blue uh, initial condition should go up to 30, but just for aesthetics, I cut it off. So uh, bear with that. Okay. Okay, so we're starting in January, going through the winter. Not much is happening yet because it's still pretty cold. And then as we go into April, the eggs start to mature, they start to mature, and then they jump over here and hatch in May. The summer is warmer, so the eggs are maturing through their lifespan. And then around late September, early October, they cross into the reproductive range and we see that some eggs start to show up here on the left. Okay, and then they're killed off in November, the bugs are killed off in November. So now we're back in the winter, not much is happening because it's cold. There's a little bit, as you see, of egg death that happens during particularly cold spells. Um, but then in April and May, they start to mature and hatch. And then again, we see this mass of bugs in the summer maturing through their life cycle. And then again, reaching reproductive age, right? And now an even bigger uh, clutch of, or collective group of eggs shows up uh, before winter of 2016, but there was a particularly cold spell, so a bunch of them died off in that case. And so now they hatch again in May, they're moving along the age axis. Again, reaching reproductive age end of September and into October, we see a bunch of eggs in the left. Nothing much is happening except a bit of death due to periods of extreme cold. Okay, and then, oops, sorry. Okay, so that was, we stopped in about May of 2018. So that was a couple of years of the Berks County simulation. Okay, and now for the sake of time, I'm just gonna jump to South Carolina where it was warmer. Okay, so same premise, we started with 30 eggs on January 1st, and now the temperature is much, much warmer, much earlier. So we see the eggs actually hatch in April as opposed to May. Um, and the temperature is very, very, very warm. And so they're advancing through their lifespan really, quickly and they actually start laying eggs in August and then this huge mass of eggs appears and what we actually see is the possibility for two sets uh, or like two generations of bugs to appear uh, in one year due to this warmer temperature but then the interesting thing right that you just saw I'll pause because nothing interesting happens in the in the video after this is that in December January of 2016 because we didn't have eggs at that time in the winter, we now had bugs, which are more susceptible, according to our model, to cold temperatures. They actually, you know, the bugs all died out, but because there were no eggs, that actually meant in this moment that the, the entire population died out. Um, okay, so those are the two simulations that I'll show you. Let me go back to my slides, okay. Right, so again, we looked at Berks County and then South Carolina. Okay, and so let's think about the reproductive number based on these simulations. So here I list the total count of eggs on January 1st of each year in the simulations for the four places that were listed. So we started at 30 in every year. And then when you look at Berks, you see that there is a little drop between 2015 and 2016, and then increases after that. So we see the population growth that we know actually did occur in Berks. And the model at, the, at these simulations in particular were calibrated to recreate the known behavior in Berks. And then you see in 
Northern Virginia, the temperature was a bit colder there that winter, so a lot of the uh, population died off and it's very slowly creeping back. So who knows, maybe on a longer time scale, it will actually gain momentum uh, and increase by much more. And then in Allegheny and South Carolina, the population was basically wiped out, but actually for two different reasons, right? In South Carolina, it was due to this, this weird timing that occurred when actually two bug cycles were able to go through in one year, and then thus the bugs were all killed off in the winter. Whereas in Allegheny, it was because the temperature was so low um, at the uh, in, in that very first winter that most of the bugs died off before they could even, sorry, most of the eggs died off before they could even hatch. Okay, and so I'm basically out of time, but I'll just mention that some of the next things that we're going to work on, in addition to further improving the model that we have, is um, to talk about the effect of diapause. Um, and so we, that's something that Seba is going to talk about in his presentation now. And we would basically split our egg function up into a dormant egg function and an active egg function. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you to Wonderful. the USDA. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say thank you to the USDA and my colleagues and everyone for your attention. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome work, Stephanie. Um, I, I think people are putting questions in the chat box for you. Yes. Okay, great. And so our next speaker now, Seba, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, is yes. Seba from Temple. Seba Dubano. Right, so can you all see the, the screen now? Yes, great. Okay, wonderful. Right, so hi everyone and thank you for attending today. Uh, my name is Seba um, and I've recently joined uh, the IE Collab at Temple um, to collaborate on the project that Stephanie just, just talked about um, and collaborating also with, with Benny uh, Sabold and Matt Helmus. Um, and so, um, the, the, my talk and Stephanie's are gonna be very, very tightly linked. So I hope you are here for, for her talk. Um, and while she, she was showing the sort of numerical implementation uh, of the model and some simulation, uh, my role in this collaboration um, is to, to help provide the biological building blocks uh, for the model uh, in the form of functions that would define uh, a life history traits and ecological uh, features of uh, spotted lanternfly. Um, and this is done through uh, mining the literature and, and, and talking to, um, to experts about it. Um, and so the outline of the talk today is gonna be um, split in three, uh, in three main topics. Uh, one, I'll be showing uh, some of the current building blocks and how they were constructed, uh, the same blocks that Stephanie just discussed. Um, then I'll, I'll spend some time talking about uh, future additions that um, we want to, um, to make to the model to improve it. Uh, and then finally, I'll briefly discuss about um, our effort to compile a comprehensive data set of spotted lanternfly presence um, in, in the US. Um, I also wanna add um, a note on the aim of the talk um, so we, we realized that this is a great opportunity for us to um, have, a, have a, um, an audience of experts. And so it's going to be a, a good sanity check to make sure that our model actually makes sense um, um, and, and it's running smoothly. And then um, the, the beauty of this model is that um, by, um, with, with the increasing knowledge uh, on, on spotted lanternfly biology and ecology, the model is going to get better and better. So we, we hope uh, after um, today to get some more insights and opinions from, um, from people uh, and potentially some directions on uh, moving forward. Uh, and so before starting, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, the one key uh, um, feature that we'll um, focus on today is temperature. Um, and this is because temperature has a, plays a key role in the life, especially of ectoterms, uh, not only defining where they can survive uh, or happily leave, uh, but also um, determining how fast uh, they will develop. And the US is characterized by a broad, uh, broad gradient of temperatures. And so it's important to account for this when, when we wanna try and model uh, the spread of spotted lanternfly in the, in the future through the US. All right, so starting with the building blocks, the first thing I'll, I'll talk about is a temperature dependent mortality. Uh, so try and tie together uh, the, the death rate of the bugs with, um, with the temperatures that they experience. Uh, and this is gonna be done separately, of course, for the eggs and for nymphs and adults that in, in, for the sake of this model are clumped together. Uh, in one stage. And so we can go into the literature and try and look for, um, for data to uh, parameterize our functions. Uh, and so for instance, uh, if we look at the lower uh, end of uh, the temperature spectrum, um, there's in, in Park's uh, thesis, there's a, a, an elegant experiment where um, eggs were um, put at different um, 
temperatures for one to 16 days to observe their hatch rate, but also their uh, survival rate. Uh, and so for, for this experiment, we can, um, uh, we can see how at, uh, below uh, minus 20 degrees, um, uh, mortality is at 100%, so there's no survival of the eggs. Uh, and then there's a, a steady increase, um, uh, or seemingly a steady increase in mortality um, below minus 10 degrees. And so we can reflect this by uh, fitting or interpolating a linear regression uh, um, that would track the increase in mortality rate between these two temperatures. We can do something similar on the upper um, side of the, of the temperature spectrum. Uh, and the same uh, uh, part's thesis um, also looks at uh, survival at higher temperatures. And here we can, we can see uh, there is no um, hatching of eggs, um, probably signifying a, a complete mortality at 33 degrees uh, Celsius and above. Um, and there's also a steep increase uh, in mortality between 27 degrees uh, and 31. So we can again interpolate a line between those two points and, and uh, come up with the um, function that Stephanie was showing um, went into the model. And we can do something similar with, um, with the uh, adults. Um, I, was, um, I was very excited to, to hear uh, from, from Devin's talk earlier because now we, have, um, we can get actually more refined information uh, when it comes to the nymphs. Um, the information that I derived for the, for the adults here actually comes from, a, um, from some um, related species uh, of plant hoppers uh, to define their especially hopper um, um, temperature tolerance. And then of course we want to have the effect of frost uh, and freezing in determining their mortality on the low end. Moving forward, as I, as I just mentioned, one um, one thing we're looking into implementing is a, a, an in-star specific temperature dependent function. So breaking up the, the, um, um, the bugs uh, into their uh, different life stages, you know, which would account for the different susceptibility of the in-star to temperature. Uh, and then another potential uh, avenue is um, when, when we are looking uh, later on at diapause, which I'll talk about briefly uh, in, in a moment, um, we can define temperature dependent uh, functions for both the dormant eggs and the developing eggs uh, and this would provide uh, a way to, uh, to model the fact that dormant eggs uh, will probably be uh, more likely to withstand um, very harsh um, or very cold conditions. Looking into another building blocks, um, as Stephanie was mentioning, uh, was to try and track uh, the development of both the eggs and the bugs. And so trying to model the advance over the age axis based on temperature. Um, we used a very um, um, simple uh, degree day model uh, with a base threshold uh, taken from, from Choi's work of 8.14 degrees and a hopper threshold around 30 degrees um, and using a, a thermal constant of 355.4 degree days for the eggs to hatch uh, and then a 2000, uh, excuse me, uh, 241 degree days for um, the uh, adults to come to uh, the reproductive stage. Um, it's important to, to uh, notice that here we are uh, modeling a population average um, and, and therefore the, this uh, temperature constant referred to the 50% of the population uh, reaching the different stages. Um, there are ways to improve this model and so something we've been looking into is to have a better definition of the upper boundary uh, instead of um, having this sort of like a uh, flat line for, um, for higher temperatures, uh, introducing a, um, a decrease in the de developmental uh, rate um, past 30 degrees Celsius. And this could be done, for example, with the uh, Breer model. Um, and of course, uh, having different uh, degree day models for the different stages uh, would also be a good addition if uh, we end up splitting um, especially if we end up splitting the um, uh, life stages of spotted lanternfly after, after hatching. Okay, now to move on on the, on the future additions. Um, the, the one thing we're really interested in including in the model is diapause, and this is because uh, it might have uh, um, very um, important, um, a very important influence in determining uh, how many life cycles uh, spotted lanternfly can go through um, especially when modeling um, their um, survival at different or their persistence at different uh, um, locations in the US. And so diapause is this state of low metabolic activity, uh, I'm sure most of you know this um, here, um, where there's reduced, reduced development but uh, increased resistance to, to stresses and we know that uh, many temperate insects and spotted lanternfly amongst them um, um, goes through diapause uh, at the egg stage. 
And so um, here we ran some simulations to, um, that would ignore or include diapause in trying to forecast the, the egg hatch. And as you can see in the uh, dotted line, we have the uh, exclusion of diapause. So the eggs immediately start accumulating degree days as, as, as soon as they're uh, laid. Whereas in the solid line, we have a, uh, um, a diapause um, that requires a, an extreme uh, cold uh, event um, for eggs to be emerging from the diapause. And in, in some days, actually in some years, excuse me, uh, the uh, differences um, in the predicted uh, emergence or hatching of the eggs, uh, it's uh, quite unsubstantial, but in some other years, especially those with, with very warm um, uh, fall uh, months, then we see uh, a uh, um, much um, uh, 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 um, hatching that is way too, happening way too early. Here's a, about a, actually over a one month uh, mismatch uh, with and without diapause. And if we want to include diapause, there's uh, two ways we can, uh, we can think about this. One is, as, a, as I just described, a single instance of a, an extremely cold um, event that would just activate all eggs. Uh, but the problem we, we, we had with this was uh, thinking about um, forecasting the development in uh, the southern USA, where uh, especially if there are particularly warm winters, we could uh, not even observe any uh, day below uh, freezing, which would mean that the eggs would just uh, all uh, be unable to um, emerge from diapause and so unable to continue with their development. Um, an alternative um, would be to have a cold degree day model um, where uh, the accumulation of uh, cold days is actually what uh, favors the termination of, of diapause. This is a little harder to parameterize um, uh, with, for, for spotted lanternfly um, and so I'll be talking about how we, we try to, to go around this um, a little bit. So we can think about the um, we can think about a rate um, of uh, emergence from diapause, um, which is defined by temperature again. And this is a little bit uh, the opposite or the inverse of um, what happened for the uh, warm degree days, where um, colder, uh, colder days would favor a, um, a faster rate towards terminating diapause. Um, and we can um, describe this function uh, with three parameters, a uh, uh, lower and an upper temperature uh, threshold, and then a maximum rate of development that is reached at the, at the lower temperature, temperature threshold. And so um, we can try and figure out these parameters from the published literature. Um, there's a study by, by Shimon Lee, um, who collected eggs monthly from November to March uh, in Korea and incubated them to observe the, their hatching rate. Uh, and the, the diapause termination was, was um, happening at, uh, um, or seemingly happening at some point between uh, December and January. You can see that the um, eggs that were collected between January and March uh, all hatched in a very similar fashion, whereas eggs that are um, collected in November and December uh, seem to have a, um, a much slower rate, uh, but also an overall much um, um, slower percentage of eggs that hatch. And so with that knowledge, we can actually use real temperatures um, in, in the same time and area where this data was collected to try and forecast the termination of diapause uh, based on a set of parameters um, that, we, uh, that we pick uh, and try and see if the, the, our predicted termination of diapause fits with the, um, um, with the results of Shin and Lee. Um, and so here, for example, this is just a, a simple example, but we have a, um, a change in value for the upper uh, temperature uh, threshold and for the maximum rate of development. Um, and we can see that uh, the red band defines what's the parameter space for a timely um, uh, end of diapause, um, whereas the, the blue defines an early uh, emergence and the uh, green a late uh, termination of the diapause. And we can do, we can do this with different um, uh, temperature data, of course, and trying to find a, uh, a set of parameters that would, um, that would work best uh, in, in multiple scenarios. And of course, this is waiting um, for, for new data uh, on, the, on diapause termination in spinal lantern fly uh, to, be, um, uh, to be coming to light. Uh, lastly, I wanted briefly to uh, talk about um, uh, a comprehensive data set uh, on spotted lantern fly presence that we've been uh, compiling. This is an effort that was started by Matt Helmus uh, and have picked up um, after joining the lab. Uh, we are we're putting together currently data from three different sources, um, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture providing um, quite a lot of data, uh, but also neighboring states like Delaware, Maryland, and, and Virginia. Uh, and then especially for the last 
uh, two or three years, uh, the USDA is, is providing the, the, bulk, the bulk of the data. We're looking into expanding our sources of data to try and have a, as comprehensive as possible picture. Uh, and this, uh, this would be um, valuable um, in trying to uh, compare our uh, forecasts um, um, from, from the model uh, with, with real data that we observe. Um, the way we're doing this is by developing an R package called iCoreMap. Um, we're using this approach uh, because um, R packages provide a really great way to bundle together all steps, uh, starting from the raw data uh, through to uh, tidying and cleaning the data and, and the final analysis. And it also enhances reproducibility and collaboration uh, through its extensive toolkit for documentation. And just to show very briefly uh, the stage we're at, we're still in the early development of the package, but we can already output um, uh, nice maps of where lanternfly is found. Here you can see in gray the negative surveys for spotted lanternfly and uh, with the colored dots um, all the, the locations that, where lanternfly was, uh, was found in the different years. And we can break up the data uh, um, as much as we want. In this case, for example, showing ear by ear uh, and, and color coded by, by the source. Uh, and, and this, especially if looking at the 2019 data, shows how important it is to uh, to compile a data set that will have different sources, um, uh, which actually would would maximize um, the uh, coverage of our of our data, which is which is important. And with this, I want to thank you um, um, for for listening to my talk, uh, and thanks all the collaborators and the people that have provided data. And Dennis Calvin, who was uh, incredible at offering help uh, on figuring out the uh, degree day model and the diapos. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Seba. Um, we don't have time for questions, but there's been a lot of um, conversation and Matt's been answering a lot of questions. So you might want to um, come up to speed in the chat box and see if there's Wonderful. any. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Eric, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, our, we're now starting the um, biocontrol part of the day. Or, um, and so here we're starting out with Eric Clifton from Cornell. Take yes, it away. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it up here. All right. All right, all good, right? It isn't quite sharing yet, but. Okay. I told it to share screen too. That's weird. Hold on. Share screen. How about now? Um, it's in, it says you started screen sharing. We can't quite see it yet, but there we go. I'll try again. Sorry about that, guys. What about now? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Julie, for the introduction. Thank you guys for attending this talk. Um, I'm a postdoc in and high lab at Cornell University, and I'll be presenting some of the ongoing work to describe these fungal pathogens affecting spotted lanternfly. And Dr. Castrillo is a co-author on this talk from the USDA, who also works on fungal pathogens. So I just have a few slides to sort of provide some background. Today, I'm mostly talking about this insect pathogenic fungus called Bavaria bassiana. And it has a cosmopolitan distribution, meaning it's found throughout the world, and it infects a wide range of different hosts. And it's actually named after the scientist Agostino Bassi, who first discovered uh, that it was the causal agent of a disease in silkworms. But this fungus has also helped to suppress populations of hemipterin pests without any human intervention. Um, in the 1860s, it greatly reduced populations of chinch bugs that were damaging crops in the Midwest. And more recently, it was actually responsible for epizootic and kudzu bug populations in Tennessee. So this diagram sort of generalizes the life cycles of fungal entomopathogens, and they infect insects through the cuticle. And so this diagram generalizes it for three different orders, and Bavaria are in the order Hypocreales, which is sort of highlighted uh, in yellow here. But after the fungus has killed its host, it will emerge out of the body to produce more spores that can spread to other susceptible hosts. And because the infection process begins with spores attaching to an insect host, some pesticide products have actually been developed using this fungus. And they're sometimes called biopesticides or mycoinsecticides. And a few different strains are actually commercialized in North America. You can see here on the left, products like Botanigard, Bioseries, Velifer. Um, and among those strains, GHA is probably the most popular most widely used. But this fungus is used in many different countries. There's more than 55 different products developed around the world. So that list and the photos on the bottom right just provide a few examples. 
Um, there is at least 25 different species of Bavaria described around the world. Um, and there are some differences between species when you look at the morphology in vivo on their insect host, or if you look at the canidia under the microscope. But otherwise, most of them have these characteristic white spore balls, which contain canidia. And canidia are just infected spores. Um, but because the phylogeny has been continually revised in recent years, molecular tools are pretty much necessary to confirm the identification of the fungus. And so before I go into my research on lanternflies, I just wanted to show some takeaways from another study that looked at Bavaria in another invasive pest, the emerald ash borer. Um, and whenever I say isolate, I'm referring to a fungus collected from one dead insect or an environmental sample. So this study has 78 Bavaria isolates from emerald ash borers in Ontario. And they found two different species, Bavaria bassiana and Bavaria pseudobassiana, but they found intraspecific intra um, variability where they had five genotypes of Bavaria bassiana and two different genotypes of pseudobassiana infecting them. And in lab bioassays, they actually found that one of these native isolates collected from the field was more virulent or better at killing emerald ash borers than the commercialized strain GHA. It's pretty interesting. So that brings me to the objectives of this study. We were to sample fungal and pathogens from spotted liner flies throughout their life cycle and in different habitats wherever we can find them. We then culture the fungus and identify them with molecular tools, um, putting these fungal isolates into a freezer for long-term storage in case we want to use them again in future experiments. Um, and when it's possible, we want to collect the same fungi from different insects in the same field sites to see if there's any overlap of different species. So, with our sequence data, we can then describe the genetic diversity of these fungi and compare them to isolates from other hosts. So I'm just talking about fungi in the order of Another project in our lab is looking at fungi in the Entomothraeales, so that includes a fungus called Bacilla major. So this map shows your field sites in Berks County, Pennsylvania, um, and most of the samples I'm talking about today come from adult lanternflies. But we went to about nine different sites in 2017 and 2018. Well, the samples in 2017 were actually provided to us. And if you've ever done PCR before, this diagram sort of summarizes the process. You can see we go and we get our, our dead lantern flies, we get a clean culture in the lab, and then we can extract our DNA through PCR and get sequence data. So here we are so far. Uh, we've identified 95 different isolates of Bavaria from lantern flies. And those numbers next to each field site represent the sample size. And I just want to note, we didn't collect every single cadaver. We randomly sampled around different trees in the surrounding ground. Some places have, you know, hundreds of these cadavers. So to date, every single isolate has been identified as the species Bavaria bassiana. But within that species, we're finding 24 distinct genotypes infecting them. So this tree on the right just sort of has letters of the alphabet to represent different genotypes, so don't get distracted by that. And I've also included the GHA strain here. None of these native isolates match GHA, they're all different. Um, and this tree is just rooted next to a different species called Bavaria Katuki. And this pie chart here, this demonstrates the prevalence of our different genotypes we found. You can see that genotype A is the most prevalent, but also B, I, and L were pretty common as well. So it seems like genotype A is the top leader here. And furthermore, this genotype was found in every field site that we sampled. Um, it's not included on my map, but part of another study, I found the same genotype A in a park close to Philadelphia, which is pretty interesting. Uh, the other genotypes here, we got B, I, and L popping up in multiple field sites. Um, you can see some of these like this site and Penn State Berks just had one sample, so we're not finding these genotypes yet. We just have to increase our sampling to know. Um, I also have a few examples of these different genotypes in vitro or on auger plates. Um, these purple plates have crystal violet and antibiotic. This one down at the bottom right doesn't have that, it's just a different recipe. Uh, but you can see that's genotype A in the top left. D and G all look different. G I like to call the starfish morphology. Uh, but in some cases, like genotype B, you can see that even though they're these two are the exact same genotype. They kind of look different. So we think that if we actually sequence some different primers and different genes, we might actually find even greater diversity at the genotypic level. And I should say here too that genotype, or sorry, GHA, the commercial strain, sort of has this uh, sand dollar morphology, as we call it. So some other findings I wanted to share. We 
did some comparisons to the GenBank database, and we find that multiple genotypes actually have a pretty high similarity to the isolates that are also infecting emerald ash borer. And genotype L actually matched isolates collected from bark beetles. So we have sort of a working hypothesis that maybe these are Bavaria that have adapted to forest habitats and infecting pests for forests or other insects in forests. Also, oops, let me go back. Genotype I uh, is actually matching 100% to the strain that's used in a biopesticide called Naturalis. Um, that strain was originally obtained from Colorado potato beetles in Maine, but it's known to sort of naturally occur throughout the Northeast. It's been sprayed in different projects, um, so that was interesting too. So, so far we've not found a lot of insects other than liner flies killed by these Bavaria, but even if we find a dead insect with no fungal outgrowth, we'll still take it back to the lab, put them in sealed cups and see if anything grows out of it. And so far from 2017, 2018, uh, we've only found four different hosts killed by these Bavaria. We've got genotype A on an ant, B on a stonefly, um, D was on this beetle, and V was on this fly. Um, it's hard to know whether this fungus jumped from these hosts to lantern flies or vice versa. So we need more sampling to discern if this is spillover or something else going on with host switching. Um, and often people ask me, well, can we weaponize these Bavaria? Can we turn this into some kind of biopesticide product? Maybe that process does take a number of years and a lot of data. Um, in the end, killing pests with fungal pathogens is a numbers game. So more spores equaling faster mortality. Um, and as you can see in the top left photo, when these adult lanternflies are killed by this commercial GHA strain, the fungus usually grows between the segments of their legs and their bodies. The pattern of growth sometimes varies, uh, but this is often what I see here in the top left. And if you look at these other photos in the yellow border, you can see that they often turn into these sort of puffy cumulus clouds and they're just loaded with spores and their legs are barely poking out. So it seems like these native isolates are yielding more spores per insect cadaver and these might have greater potential for spreading to other lantern flies and suppressing the population. Um, so what comes next? What are we going to do? Well, in the interest of controlling and managing lantern flies now, we're already testing some of these products. Um, we have a paper coming out in environmental entomology soon where we actually spray this Bottega product in a public park. Um, but this summer we're planning to test different strains of Bavaria, including products like BioSeries, Naturalis, um, and Bellifer. And then uh, we also, if you want to know whether or not these native isolates are any good at killing liner flies, we're going to have to grow those up in the lab, test them against liner flies, and see if they produce more spores, they have better shelf life, and so forth, if you wanted to ever make some kind of product out of the native isolate. But also, we want to expand our sampling beyond places in Berks County. So if any of you outside of Pennsylvania see these kinds of fungi, please get in touch with us. So to summarize, only one species so far has been identified infecting liner flies in Pennsylvania. That was Bavaria bassiana. But genotype A, as I showed on that pie chart and that map, that was found every field site that we sampled. And besides Batcoa major, we have not found other types of fungi or other genera infecting liner flies, including species like Metarizium or Isaria, um, but we're still hunting for those. And currently we're still identifying samples from 2019 to see if we find more genotypes or if we continue to find the same ones we found already. Um, but otherwise future studies can further characterize these fungi and determine whether or not they're safe for biocontrol. Um, here's all the people I'd like to acknowledge and funding sources, and then I'll take questions if you have any. Thank you. Great, a lot of, inf lot of really good information there, Eric. Um, Okay, we have from Emily Swackhammer. Um, oh, she just said, uh, there's something very satisfying to see all Eric's images of fungus killed SLF. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a, a question for you. Uh, have you found um, fungus attacking other life stages, um, eggs or nymphs? Um, we've seen, one of the samples from 2018 was actually from a nymph. I've had some nymphs I sampled in 2019 that were first or second in stars. Just put them on potted tree of heaven plants in the lab. They died on their own and some of them did have Bavaria. So I have seen it um, infecting nymphs and adults. Um, people have seen 
fungi growing on eggs. We're looking into that, but it's hard to say whether or not those are pathogens or saprophytes. So can't say too much about that just yet. Gotcha. But what you have seen, like a nymphs and whatnot, that is Bavaria? Yeah, just Bavaria so far. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? There's one at the bottom, it looks like. Um, okay. Um, maybe I missed this, but what genes or genetic markers did you use to define your genotypes? And what others might you look at in addition? Um, we use one called the Block Nuclear Intergenic Region. It's commonly used to identify uh, fungal species. There's a few different genes like elongation factor. Um, there's some kind of, there's a, there's a few others, but yeah, some of the studies often use like three or four different primer pairs. So we might do that to dig deeper, especially for those genotypes that may look different on the auger plates. But um, yeah, for now, we're just using that block gene. Okay. Awesome. Um, other questions might pop up, so you might want to watch the chat bar, but thank you very much, Eric. Yep, thanks. All right. Our next speaker is Liam Sullivan. So Liam, if you want to start sharing your screen here um, from the APHIS uh, PPQ, the Otis Lab, and UMass Amherst. Hi, thank you for that. Um, as you said, I work uh, for USDA APHIS at the Otis Lab, as well as uh, in cooperation through uh, U uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, we, uh, in the Gould slash Broadly Lab now, uh, have been working for the last couple of years on developing uh, some potential biocontrol agents that have been uh, brought in uh, from China. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Dryanosinicus. Uh, so briefly, we have our two species here is Anastatus orientalis. That's a uh, Eupelmid egg parasitoid, and Dryanus sinicus, uh, which is a nymphal parasitoid. Uh, just briefly, an overview, the family Dryanidae, it's fairly small, about 1900 described species. They are all uh, nymphal parasitoids and also predators of the Aconorhynchia, which includes our friends the spotted lanternfly. Um, morphologically, they're very distinct with these uh, raptorial forelegs, and uh, they even some will utilize a uh, venom to paralyze their nymphs. Uh, this lower photo on the right you can see is a parasitized nymph uh, with these thalassium uh, forming with larvae feeding on the, uh, the abdomen there. Um, briefly, here's the, some life cycle information. So we have our adult wasp emerging early in the year, uh, either spring or early summer. They will then parasitize nymphs. Uh, here's an example of a spotted lanternfly with an engorged thalassium, uh, which from that picture that, that uh, larvae is just about to emerge. And then uh, we have a piece of elanthus with uh, a small cocoon on it. Those are about uh, three to five millimeters. Um, so here are some very scientific photos for you. Uh, we have uh, just an overview of their uh, behavioral cycle. So it's emergence, as I said, they will then, uh, after emerging from the cocoon, the females will host feed. They will then seek out, grapple and para paralyze a, uh, a, fe a nymph of their choice for oval position, will then lay their eggs in it, and uh, the larvae will feed, emerge, and overwinter as a cocoon. Uh, so our species here, the Dryanus sinicus, we know that it attacks second and third instar nymphs uh, specifically. This is from uh, early observations. Uh, rates of parasitism vary between 20 and 40 percent, though uh, our data is very low estimate for now, um, hoping to get more numbers as the time goes on. Uh, and that parasitism rate couple, um, what would make Dryanus an interesting um, biocontrol agent is uh, there are some species of Dryanus that have been used previously in biocontrol efforts that show upwards of 37% uh, uh, parasitism and then an additional 35% mortality under lab conditions uh, on hosts. So uh, over 70% control uh, in under lab conditions. Um, 
And uh, lastly, we have uh, some colonies that have been initiated now between our lab in Massachusetts and the uh, Beneficial Insects Introduction Rearing Unit with Kim Homer down in Delaware. Um, it was started back in 2018, but we uh, have not had much success uh, so far uh, with emergence being low coming from the cocoons and uh, anything that's been shipped to us in the form of live parasitized nymphs has had very high rates of mortality. Um, so I'll, I'll roll in. We've we've had to adjust quite a bit as time has gone on. So last year, uh, this was our method, our initial method of rearing. We would take our dryanid females, uh, about one to two per cage. As I said, we've had very low numbers uh, of uh, adults to work with. So this is. Uh, all ideally uh, what we would have. Um, we only had three females that came in from the field and then three females emerged from in containment and two uh, males as well. So very few insects to work with initially. And so they were placed in a vinyl cage with uh, two to second and third instar nymphs on cut foliage from Tree of Heaven. These cuttings were changed three times per week uh, after initial 24 hours of exposure, uh, nymphs were examined for signs of parasitism. And then any uh, nymphs that were unparasitized were removed, uh, so as well as dead nymphs. And then uh, parasitized nymphs were placed back in the cage to develop further. We had some issues with this uh, as um, we had more high mortality that we believe was due to uh, handling. The first instar nymphs can be very delicate to handle and therefore uh, easy to squish or stress. Uh, and it's possible as well that the nutrition provided by the cut uh, material was not enough to sustain uh, the compromised nymphs that now had uh, parasites feeding on them as well. Uh, so we changed a few things up. The females were again uh, placed into a cage, but this time we used whole potted plants, which you started growing in our facility. Uh, and to reduce the amount of handling we were doing, we started uh, just removing five to ten nymphs after a four-day period of exposure and placing them into these uh, 10 centimeter centrifuge tubes with uh, cut pieces of elanthus foliage. Uh, and we were replacing those nymphs as time went on in, in back into the cages to allow the uh, dryanids to both host feed and oviposit further. Um, so in these tubes, uh, if you look at the lower photo on the right, you can see uh, a little nymph feeding on a stem. Uh, we could see uh, after those four days, if we placed anything under microscopes, we could see, uh, under a dissection scope rather, we could see the developing thalassium at its earliest stages. Uh, but after seven to 10 days, the thalassium would become large enough to uh, be visible with the naked eye. And then the, this process was continued, this foliage in the tubes was changed daily uh, until the larvae emerged and then pupated. So from this year, we were able to get uh, a total of five drainage to emerge. Uh, and that resulted uh, in combination with the three uh, females that we got from the field. It gave us 30 parasitized nymphs, which uh, produced seven cocoons. Um, so low numbers for us right now, but uh, very low starting numbers as well. But well, the biggest uh, takeaway, which will help us in this coming year, is some observations that we're able to make. Uh, it was initially believed that our females were short-lived from observations that came out of the field. Uh, we saw, to the contrary, that they had a lifespan of 30 to 60 days. Males, on the other hand, had very short lifespans. The females were in these cages presented with uh, honey as well as water wicks initially, uh, but through observations, we saw that they didn't appear to go towards the honey or use, utilize the water, that the, their primary food sources were both the honeydew produced by the insects themselves that was spattered on the cages and from host feeding. 
there was a preference towards attacking second instar nymphs. Um, it, I would hypothesize that the, the smaller nymphs are easier for them to catch as the third instar nymphs are about the same size. Uh, in the presence of females, we, uh, female wasps, we could see uh, uh, what I call a hiding behavior amongst the foliage. Um, anyone who's seen the SLF nymphs feed as they normally would be along the uh, main stem or on the larger uh, leaflets, but in this case they would tangle themselves up in the foliage to uh, what I think avoid the uh, parasite. Uh, some data for the, or some information rather for the thalassium, which is important for our development. Uh, as I said, you could see it under magnification within one to four days of oviposition, first becoming obvious within seven to ten days, and from parasitation to uh, oh, emergence of the larva took us about three weeks. And uh, these small potted plants uh, appear to sustain the nymphs a lot better, which for a nymphal parasitoid is important to have a healthy uh, source. And also having to feed the nymphs for long periods of times after the uh, parasitization, parasitization event um, means we need really, really good nutrition to keep them alive. Um, though we, we can't for sure say that it is a nutritional aspect. It could also very well be uh, to do with uh, stronger capillary pressure from the whole plant. Um, so this coming season, uh, we're going to be importing more um, cocoons that our collaborators in China are hopefully gonna be able to rear out for us through the season. They, and they're also going to collect and ship, ship to us adult wasps. Uh, and as for updating our rearing methods, we plan to continue to refine this method uh, as presented, then test a few other methods, uh, such as this one on the, this diagram on the right, uh, which is uh, used to rear uh, rice plant hoppers, uh, wherein the dryanids are, instead of left in a cage continuously, they are transferred and then the nymphs are left to develop unharried. Uh, we also will have to work on refine, uh, refining and developing methods for breaking diapause uh, as we've had low emergence from year to year uh, with the cocoons that have been sent to us. So that will be a big part of uh, improving our population size. And then we will uh, move into compiling a list of potential non-target non hosts here in the U.S. for eventual host range testing. And uh, I think that dovetails nicely into uh, Tyler and Alana following up with anastatus host range testing. So a uh, couple of people to acknowledge is other technicians at the lab. This is a, a real bear of a project maintaining plants, uh, a population of plants, as well as uh, healthy nymphs to present to our dryanids, um, to our collaborators in China sending us cocoons and parasitized in uh, adults and parasitized nymphs. And then uh, to uh, Dr. Olney, uh, who uh, did some identification work for us. So uh, if anybody has any questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Leon. That's really, really interesting stuff. Okay, we have a couple of questions here. Um, David Middinger asks, how many species of dryanus are there in the east? And I presume he means in the eastern U.S. because he said that he gets some in bee pan trap and wondered if maybe the adults were attracted to color or nectar at flowers in addition to host feeding. Uh, as for that, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I know of at least one species in, on the east coast uh, that's been exported for biocontrol in Europe, but um, past that I'm not really sure on species numbers. And then Martha Hunter asked, do the nymphs fight back? And is that why females prefer second instars rather than thirds? From what I observed, uh, the attack events still occur um, in or around the foliage. So being able to see that is very difficult. But once 
the nymphs have been grasped. Uh, they are fairly docile, which is uh, what led me to believe that they may have uh, paralytic venom like the uh, like some of the other species in the family. I think generally they're just a little bit easier uh, to wrangle as um, the nymphs themselves tend to uh, jump when disturbed. Right. That makes sense. Good answer. Um, I don't, does anyone else have any questions? Because we're just coming up on 2.30 now. All right. So, um, all right, so I would say, Liam, thank you very much. You might want to keep an eye on the chat if other, <laughs> that's great, if other questions come up. And then we'll hand it off. It is a good segue to Tyler. So Tyler, if you want to start sharing your screen. We have Tyler Haggerty from University of Delaware. Take it away, Tyler. Thank you, Julie. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay, so yeah, my name is Tyler. I'm from the University of Delaware, and I'll be talking about non-target rearing techniques for spotted lanternfly biocontrol testing. Uh, I've done this in Dr. Bartlett's lab with the help of Dr. Kim Homer and Dr. Hannah Broadley. And I did want to make note, as Liam has said, this is a two-part presentation. So I will be presenting on species for non-targets within Akinarenka and Red Abides. And then up next, Alana will be presenting on other hemipteran species, Lepidoptera and Mantodia as well. So for this presentation, I'll try and keep it brief. I'm going to be buzzing through a lot of different species, but we'll quickly cover the problem and my research objective, and then we'll go into the rearing techniques for some of the species that I've been working on. So like Liam said, we do have two primary biocontrol agents that we're looking at right now. Uh, so the problem is obviously the control of spotted lanternfly, and one answer might be using biocontrol. Uh, Dryanus sinensis, as Liam just described, is a nymphal parasitoid, and then we also have Anastatus orientalis, which is an egg parasitoid. So basically they just lay their eggs into anis, uh, SLF eggs and then kill them that way. Now with biocontrol, you can have some issues. Uh, it's been well documented. If you don't know who my little friend is down here, this is the cane toad, Rhinella marina. And the cane toad was introduced into Australia in 1935 to control this little cutie up here, the grayback cane toad. But what happened was it ate everything else and got so prolific that people would drive down the roads in their vans and smash them on the side of the road. If anybody hasn't seen this documentary, this is cane toads and unnatural history. It's an excellent watch. I highly advise you go look it up. So this moves into my research as well as a lot. Um, we are looking at native species that could possibly be impacted by biocontrol agents. And those native species need to be researched so that we can then have them to offer these parasitoids to see what their interactions are. And those types of choice and no choice tests are done at USDA facilities such as Buzzards Bay. For my research, I focused on hemipteran species that may serve as subjects for host suitability testing. I wanted the species that I worked on to be closely related to spotted lanternfly phylogenetically. Uh, larger bodied, if we knew how they laid their eggs, we focused on eggs that were deposited above ground and just had biologically relevant features such as when they reached adulthood, when they laid eggs and such. So to recap real fast, we basically just want to make sure that biological control agents such as Orientalis here does not favor our native species and instead does favor spotted lanternfly, which is the purpose of this research. For species selection, I focused within hemipterans. Ma majority of my species are within Auchinorhynx. Uh, for today, I will be talking about Membracids, Dictyopherids, Achinoneids, Flatids, and Fulgorids, with Fulgorids being the most important because it is the exact same family as spotted lanternfly. And then to spice it up, just so it's not just Akinarenka, I also threw in a retivide species that I've worked with as well for this presentation. In total, I've worked with a fair amount of species, but for today, I'm only talking about the ones that have the check marks near them. So we'll start with Aurelis cristatus or the wheel bug and work our way down and end with Pulvisia fuliginosa, which is the species in the family Fulgoridae. Diving right in, I'll give you just basically a brief synopsis of how I've found to rear each species with the main goals of getting eggs as well as hatching nymphs so that we could test both Anastatus orientalis and the Dryana species at future times. For Aurelis cristatus, I was actually donated 
eight, I wasn't able to find any in this last year's field season. I was donated six females and two males, so a good ratio. I kept them in critter keepers, as you can see up in this photo here, but I also lined the top with mesh before putting on the lids because I thought that giving them a better climbing surface at the top might be beneficial. I fed them a number of different insect species that I could find, including tenebrios, uh, anasotristus, squash bugs up here, and I fed them every day to try and keep them fed and happy. Mating was achieved. I did observe one male and female couple, and the male did walk away, so that was nice and eggs were acquired. The majority of the eggs were laid in these clusters here on the roof, the mesh that I had installed, and those clusters ranged from anywhere between a single egg, which wasn't a cluster, to upwards of 140 eggs in one cluster. I then cut the mesh around the eggs, hot glued them to uh, pipette tips, which I glued to a piece of plastic and put into a container. I covered that with mesh, sealed it with a rubber band, and put it in a growth chamber at 25C with a 16-8 light cycle. And luckily enough, was able to hatch out a large amount of eggs. So of the 250-ish eggs that I had placed in the growth chamber, I was at able to hatch out roughly 150 of those nymphs. Unfortunately, that was about three days before the school shut down for COVID, so I was unable to continually buy fruit flies to feed these little guys, so they didn't make it, but going forward, at least now I know how to acquire eggs and nymphs for the species for both those testing. Moving into Auchinorhynchia now, we have Rhychomitra microrhina. This is a dictyopharid species that is native to the area. It was fairly understudied before I started working with it, and I was able to collect only adults of the species from July through September in Delaware. For rearing this species, I set them up in large mesh cages, as you can see here. I took 24 or 28 quart underbed storage bins, drilled holes in it, and filled it with soil, and then planted it with solidago species, as well as just some common uh, wetland weeds that I was finding while I was collecting. The reason I went with this big storage bin at the bottom was to provide a really damp habitat for them because I was primarily collecting them out of wetland areas. Once all of the adults had died, I went through and I took all the plants out and took a look at them and found eggs from the species, as you can see here. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is the first time that eggs were recorded from this species, and they were laid very loosely right where in the crease where the petiole branches off of the main node. So basically where these leaves would branch off of the main stem of the plant. And it seemed like really the only way that they were attached to the plant was the fibers of the plant just kind of holding on to them. After give or take 210 days, I took of the eggs sitting in soil. I took them off the plants and I put them onto soil. They turned this pinkish coloration. The filamentous cap started to retract. And about six to seven days after that, I was able to hatch out um, roughly about five individuals. I didn't have a lot of plant material at the time, so I was unable to get these nymphs to adulthood, but we were able to couple the cycle of collecting adults, eggs, and nymphs for the species for future testing. A new addition for this year for my research was Thelia, or this past year was Thelia bimaculata, or the locust tree hopper. This is a membracid species, also uh, native to the area. Once here, you can see them out in the wild. Uh, the ones with the yellow are the males, and these darker bark colored ones are the females. I was able to collect a large amount of them, and I kept them in the same rearing cages as the previous species, but instead of giving a big bin, I had two planted black locust trees, which is the primary host for this species, in with them. I let them mature and stay in there until basically all the adults died, and then I removed the trees and cut them apart and looked at them under the microscope. I was able to obtain eggs from the species. This is one 16 and a half inch long chunk of the trunk of one of the trees, and here you can see an egg or eggs laid, what they do is they cut a small slit into the tree and then deposit between one and five from what I was counting, eggs. These eggs are exposed to the air so they could be found by a parasitoid if the parasitoid was on that tree. And within this 16 and a half inch trunk there was a total of 64 eggs alone. That doesn't include the eggs that were laid up higher in the tree and off some of the branches. Uh, since I did do this last year, I haven't, these haven't emerged yet, but hopefully I'll have emergence soon this year for nymph acquisition as well. 
Moving on to the Akinella Neids, uh, this slide covers Akinella conica and Bivitata. I put them both on the same slide because they're very, they're pretty much identical for rearing. They were kept in the same rearing cages as before with black locusts as well as a host for them. They were collected in Delaware. They are both native species. Conica is this species here with the nice green dorsal. And uh, over here you can see Bivitata, which has these darker lines on it coming from the head. Eggs were laid from this species in both the woody and the new growth, and they're laid in what I like to call the half zipper. So the female lifts up part of the tree material, deposits an egg, and then covers it in a little bit of flocculent wax. So it looks like a little bit of, like a half zipper. Um, this is a little bit more woody section of the plant. And here you can see in the new growth of the plant, this white strip is all the eggs. And I also found that Bivitata likes to lay in the actual thorns of the locust trees, which I found very interesting. These eggs are ex not exposed directly, but could be found by parasitoids. And I took the trees that had eggs, I put them in a cooler greenhouse at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. We couldn't get a greenhouse any lower at the time. And I was able to hatch out nymphs of both Conica and Bivitata, and I was able to rear the Conica nymphs to adulthood. So we were able to get all the life stages that we needed for possible uh, parasitoid testings in the future. Second to last family, I'm breezing through, is Flattermanus proxima. Uh, this is in the family Flatidae. This is the northern flatted plant hopper. Again, a native species. I was able to collect nymphs and adults in Delaware, rear both, uh, all of them to adulthood. I kept them in mesh rearing cages with black locusts because luckily enough, this was a host species for uh, Flattermanus as well. And eggs were acquired from the females of the species. They laid them in strips, uh, in lines, as you can see here. The eggs resemble basically, uh, the easiest thing I can describe them as is a toilet paper roll. And they would just basically line each egg up front to back all the way up. The lines consisted from anywhere between two to three eggs up to my, the longest strip was 48 eggs. I think it really depends on the size of the tree. And these eggs are half embedded in the tree growth. So like all the previous species, they are exposed to the elements so they could be found if a parasitoid was walking along the tree. I was able to hatch out nymphs, as you can see here, this little fluffy ball uh, from Flatter Menace. Unfortunately, they didn't reach adulthood, but it was good that we were able to acquire nymphs from the species through rearing techniques. And the last and most important species that I've worked with so far for non-target testing would have to be Publicia fuliginosa. This is in the family Fulgoridae, same as SLF. I traveled to North Carolina to collect this species because that's kind of the shortest distance I can go south to find a large amount of them. I kept them in a large rearing container that I built myself so that we could accommodate five foot tall winged sumac plants, which is the primary host for this species. And before we started working with them, no eggs were documented, but we were really surprised to find that the eggs of the species, once I acquired them, were very similar to spotted lanternfly. So in these three photos here, you can see this is Publicia fuliginosa eggs that are covered in an equal waxy covering, similar to SLF. These are almost completely uncovered eggs. I did not uncover these. Publicia lays eggs like this at times, which we're still unsure of why. And here you have some spotted lanternfly eggs, just as a comparison. The major differences are the Publicia eggs are a little bit smaller, and you can clearly see each individual egg when it's covered as opposed to fresh uh, spotted lanternfly eggs just kind of look like a waxy blob as opposed to this ridging here. Whoops. I was able to hatch out two nymphs my first year working with this species, but unfortunately I had no food, so I just used them for photographic purposes. The, this past season, I kept the eggs in the greenhouse, which I thought would be okay because of the heat of North Carolina, but it turned out that this still actually desiccated the eggs, even if they were wrapped in this waxy covering. One nymph did emerge. I didn't find him till later on. I called him Lonesome George. He was the only one that hatched out. This is him right here. And he did a close as an adult. So that was great. It meant that if I can hatch them out, I will be able to rear them to adulthood. So for Publicia, we were able to at least figure out, give or take, how to get both adults and nymphs to adults eggs and then hatch those eggs in small numbers though. To wrap up, I just want to note that some eggs have been sent already to the USDA for testing with Anastatus orientalis. Uh, we've sent all of the species listed here so far, and the only one that has been parasitized by orientalis has been Publicia phalanginosa. You can see here, this is a Publicia phalanginosa egg mask with Anastatus orientalis emergence holes, but it is 
important to note that of the hatching anastatus, a majority were male, and of the females that did hatch, they were much smaller. So this is females hatched from or uh, publicia eggs, and these are orienta anastatus orientalis eggs hatched from SLF eggs. So there is a, definitely a difference here. With that, I'd like to thank uh, my committee as well as my cooperators, my funding, my colleagues, my field help, and especially my wife who travels down to North Carolina with me and catches all of the publicia. And if I have time, I'll take any questions. That is fantastic work, Tyler. I mean, knowing how little we know about any plant hopper natural history in the literature and um, even what we know you're you're kind of disproving here. It's that I am so impressed with all of that work. Um, I, you know, dictyopherids are supposed to be laying their eggs, you know, mm -hmm. in debris at the base of the plant from anything that Lois and folks have written. It was really interesting that you got the right Gamitra eggs on the plant. Yeah, they're very similar to um, things like uh, the European uh, dictyopherid. So that's how I was able to identify the eggs. But yeah, I scavenged through all of that soil and saw no eggs there at all. Man, what about scolops? Do you scolops, know? I've been able to collect. I think I've seen them mate, but in two major years of working with them, I haven't collected any eggs from them. Ah. Yeah, they're just real stingy with laying, apparently. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tyler. No problem. All right. Next up, we have Alana Russell. You can go ahead and start sharing your screen, Alana, from University of Rhode Island. Take it away, Alana. Sorry, Alana, you've just been promoted. <laughs> yep, I, just, I just, sorry about that. Thanks, Heather. You just come back in the room and fix it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that, Alana. That's all right. <laughs> all right, so let me share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Yes, that looks great. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Julie, and um, thank you, Tyler, for giving a good introduction. I'm going to be speaking about part two of our non-target rearing techniques for spotted lanternfly biocontrol testing. Um, so we're co-contributing URI and University of Delaware on this project. So I am a research assistant at the URI biocontrol lab. This lab is directed by Dr. Lisa Tewksbury and powered together by Lisa, myself, and many, many hardworking students that we have to thank for um, their dedication and work. Um, so in this lab, we have a USDA inspected containment facility where we conduct research on invasive pests and potential biocontrol agents. We also have multiple non-quarantine labs where we conduct other biocontrol and invasive species research, rearing, and monitoring which includes our spotted lanternfly relevant research um, that we're contributing to currently. Um, so thank you to both Tyler and Liam for doing a great job introducing both of the parasitoid species that are um, being tested for potential spotted lanternfly biocontrol. Uh, you made my job easy, not having to go through it, but briefly that is uh, the egg parasitoid Anastatus orientalis um, and the nymphoparasitoid Drynus cynicus. Um, so we're just sort of getting started working out our rearing techniques, but we are currently um, rearing non-target insects to contribute to the host range testing of Anastatus orientalis. Um, so those tests are being conducted at the um, USDA APHIS um, Otis Lab in Buzzards Bay, uh, Massachusetts. Um, and as Tyler mentioned, he's primarily been focusing on hemipterans that are close phylogenetically to spotted lanternfly, so that's mainly the Okenorinka, um, and also then some of the Regivides. Um, we've been rearing some other hemipterans, um, heteropterans specifically, which are still taxonomically related to spotted lanternfly, uh, but not maybe as close as the suborder 
uh, Okinorinka. Um, additionally, we're rearing some Lepidopterans. That's because uh, in Korea, they discovered that Anastatus would parasitize silk moth eggs um, only when they were dissected from the female ovaries first. Um, but as a result, we'd like to contribute to rearing some of the silk moth species and as well as others, maybe such as uh, tent caterpillars. Lastly, we've been rearing some species of mantoria or mantids. Um, they're not as phylogenetically close to spotted lanternfly, but we are interested in testing them because they lay their eggs in masses or uthiki. Um, and of course, maybe more to come, we'd like to rear some coleoptera such as lady beetles um, and also other species of hemiptera and lepidoptera as we come along. But today I'm going to speak about some of these species that I've highlighted in this list, um, our rearing techniques and successes and such. The first species is the brown stink bug, Euschistus cervus. Um, so we field collected adults uh, this past fall 2019. Um, so far we have two generations that have been produced in the lab. Um, our rearing mostly comprises of Early instar nymphs are reared in 32 ounce bug dorms. Um, as they grow a little bit bigger um, into adulthood, we'll tra we transition them into 17 by 17 inch um, cages, um, as pictured here on the right. We provision these uh, cups and cages with a variety of host plants because um, brown stink bug does have a fairly broad host range, that, but they definitely do seem to like the beans and such. Um, we've noticed that some of the lab reared females are basically ready to mate and oviposit just, just shortly after adult occlusion, um, but some go, do go straight into reproductive diapause, um, and that can be seen by the presence of a, a reddish brownish ventral surface, um, yeah, ventral surface of the reproductive, uh, of the dive housing uh, individuals, as opposed to a greenish ventral surface of the reproductively active individuals. Um, so currently what we're doing is experimenting with rearing temperatures, cold periods, and host plant species and phenophase to optimize the oviposition and get something consistent going out. Similarly to brown stink bug, we have been rearing the green stink bug um, in the same sort of uh, early in star cup setup and then later in star and adult cage setup. Um, we also uh, field collected those adults in fall of 2019. We were able to get some eggs that we then um, were able to rear through to adulthood. So that first lab reared generation is currently overwintering. Um, we're giving them a cold period um, and we're hoping after that cold period we will um, that will encourage some mating and egg laying and we can get good colonies going of green stink bugs. We're also rearing um, two species of squash bugs. So that is Anaza tristis and Anaza armidra. Um, pictured on the left, you can see the Anaza tristis have something funky going on. Um, we've learned a lot along the way. Early on, our adult uh, tristis were originally ovipositing their eggs on the dorsum of other adults. We concluded that that was likely due to poor turgor pressure of cut foliage that we were using. So we adapted to that and transitioned into using potted plants. After we started using the potted plants, we definitely had a lot more success with the adults laying where they should. Um, and we were able to get quite a few egg masses from, from the Nasotristis. We currently don't have a colony going of Tristis, but we're hoping as the growing season continues, we can go collect more individuals and um, get a colony going again. Um, so additionally, we're rearing an Armidra, which is the horn squash bug. It can be distinguished from um, the other squash bug by the presence of this little horn in the front of the head. Um, so far, after overwintering, giving a cold period to our first lab rear generation, we were able to get mating and egg laying. So here's one of my mating pairs um, here on the right. And also here's some of the uh, newly hatched nymphs that came from the eggs. These eggs are a brilliant coppery bronze color, so they're really neat. So as we're continuing to rear the uh, Anaza armidra colony, we are paying close attention to certain details such as oviposition preferences um, as it's related to host, the host plant that they were reared on. We read from the literature that there could be um, host preference 
uh, OVA position preferences based on that. So we, we're keeping track of that closely so that we can optimize our rearing and get um, uh, the most OVA position that we can. Next, we have a predatory uh, hemipteran, the pale green assassin bug, Zelus theridus. Um, so we were able to field collect a cohort um, in fall of 2019 again. From that, we produced four egg masses. Uh, the egg masses pictured here on the left are pretty neat, kind of elongate in that mass. We noticed that the females seemed to die shortly after oviposition. Um, so we weren't able to keep a colony going of that. Um, and additionally, the, um, the nymphs overwin the overwintering life stage is a subadult nymph. Um, so we didn't have any of those. However, it is spring, so it's zealous hunting time. And we currently have two zealous nymphs in our colony um, that we're feeding some of our aphids from our feeder colonies. And we're hoping to collect more and boost up those numbers so we can get some good egg layers there. Next, in terms of Lepidoptera, uh, we have enlisted help from Alex Baranowski, uh, a URI graduate student and Lepidopterist extraordinaire. Uh, Alex has been rearing Lepidoptera since he was a child, and he is a wealth of knowledge and experience in terms of rearing Lepidoptera, especially um, silk moths, etc. cetera. Um, so currently, Alex has been helping us rear uh, he's got a colony of eastern tent caterpillars uh, that are around fifth to sixth in star. Pictured on this bottom right here is Alex's uh, cage setup. So on the right is sort of the nesting cage where um, the caterpillars spend most of their time. Though connected to, to that cage through a tube is an aquarium where he places most of the foliage and that is his foraging cage. So these uh, caterpillars are able to go from their foraging area back to their nesting area um, from there. So Alex has experience rearing a lot of different Lepidopterans. He does most of that um, in the early egg stage in, and early uh, larval stage in small cups pictured here. Um, and then once they grow a little bit bigger, he'll move them into bins that look like this. Um, so we're really excited to have Alex on board. He is extremely knowledgeable and hardworking and will certainly be an asset to your some native silk moths and tent caterpillars and more. In terms of Mantodia, we have um, our first species that we reared out was the Chinese mantis Ch Tenodera sinensis. So I know that's not a native to North America, but it is naturalized in this area. So we started out collecting those in the fall of 2019. So we took those field collected, they were mated adult females, ready to oviposit right away. And we stuck them in oviposition cages with some foliage for perches and plenty of um, food. Once they were nice and fat, they easily laid their othiki here. Um, they seemed to really, maybe, they had a tendency to, to lay their eggs on the mesh screening of our cages, but they also would lay on some branches that we provided. Um, so we were able to get 30 othiki from, from these Chinese mantid females. Additionally, we're rearing uh, Stagma mantis limbata, that's the bordered mantis. Uh, that's a native to North America, but more the Southwest or Western North America. We received these uthiki from Davis, California. So we are currently rearing them through, uh, hopefully to mated adults so that we can get some pairs going and um, get some overposition. Additionally, we have another stagma mantis species. That's the Carolina mantid. These were mantids that were actually field collected this winter from uh, Brooklyn, New York. I was really surprised to hear that there was a, um, a population of Carolina mantids, which are a southeastern eastern species in Brooklyn, New York City. Um, so we were able to collect those and we are also currently rearing them through to mated adult. The Brooklyn Bridge, Collect Brooklyn Bridge Park collection trip was really fun. We did that this January. 
Um, thanks to Pavel, he is pictured on the left here of this left picture. He's the Brooklyn Bridge Park gardener and mantis expert. We were able to get in touch with him and have him lead us around this park, which is quite tiny, and show us some of the Carolina mantis uh, uthiki that he knew of. Um, it's this park is quite amazing because it's smack dab in the middle of Brooklyn, such a small place, but the gardeners do a really, really good job of maintaining native flora and fauna and have a really good ecosystem going, just smack dab in the middle of New York City. Um, on the right is my artsy attempt of a photo of a uh, Carolina Manted Uthika with the New York City skyline in the background. In terms of our rearing setup, the young and stars we would set up in groups of about 30 in two small bins. So you can see that in the upper left portion of the picture is one of our smaller wearing bins. After third instar, we did cuff them up individually to avoid cannibalism. And those individual cups would have a few pieces of raffia straw for perches. And then we would provision with some of our feeder insects from our colonies, um, that's aphids, fruit flies, and crickets. So we've been rearing all of those colonies in-house um, to have available whenever we need. We also have sort of a, a uh, mesh and cotton lid that we're able to moisten with water to improve hum humidity within these cups to help encourage proper molting and such. So currently we have at least 70 Limbata nymphs and over 100 Carolina nymphs that we're hoping will make it through at least some of them to adulthood so that we can pair them off and mate them. In terms of preliminary results, so these were, we have been able to rear some of these, send off some of these egg masses um, to the USDA Otis lab for no choice tests of anastatus. Um, so this table here was adapted from some of Hannah Broadley's data of the species that we were able to send. That was the brown stink bug was tested, green stink bug, both species of squash bugs, the pale green assassin bug, the domestic silk moth, and the Chinese mantid. They were all tested. Of those, however, um, the brown stink bug, green stink bug, and horned squash bug did show positive hits for wasp development and emergence. Um, however, you will note, so similarly to what um, Tyler reported with Publicia, there is a little bit of a difference here with um, some of the um, non-target wasp development um, only showing males versus males and females. Um, however, the green stink bugs did um, show uh, male and female wasp development and emergence. So the next steps that we'd like to contribute here is to keep sending egg masses off to Otis so that they can fulfill the total number of replicates that they need. Um, also, we'd like to send off more egg masses when they're ready to conduct choice tests, which may be a little bit more ecologically relevant and show if there's a preference for anastatus between the non-targets and spotted lanternfly. And we're also really excited. We're hoping that we can rear some of these non-target insects to uh, contribute to the host range testing of dryness as well. And with that, I just wanted to say thank you. We're, we are funded and going to be funded by the SCRI Spotted Lanternfly Grant, as well as the Plant Protection Act. And I just wanted to thank the many students and volunteers who have contributed to this project. Without them, we wouldn't be able to rear as many species that, as we have, and especially those feeder colonies, which take a lot of work. Um, and with that, if I have any time, I'll, I'll take questions. Great work, Alana. That is fantastic. Um, we're running a little bit off time, so if you could uh, keep an eye out, like stop sharing your screen, and anybody who has questions, can if you could take them on the chat, and we'll line up Robert. Our, Robert, so if you want to start sharing your screen, our next speaker is Robert Malek from the University of Trento. Take it away, Robert. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good Great. afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert. I, uh, I just finished my PhD a couple of weeks ago from the University of Trento and from Fondazione Edmond Mac in Italy. 
Um, the work I'll be presenting to you this afternoon is um, uh, 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 what was carried out at, uh, at Kim Holmer's lab in Delaware uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Julie Gould's lab. And, uh, and it's about the footprints and the utica of Lycorma delicatula and how they influence the host searching and acceptance of the egg parasitoid Anastatus orientalis. Now, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on repeating why the spotted lanternfly is a serious pest. Um, I'll just quickly mention that uh, apparently in the, in the invaded areas, it seems to be released from natural enemies. Uh, at least from from um, uh, from other insect natural enemies, uh, and that um, there was a failure of the eradication efforts by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, which led the insect to spread to um, to several neighboring states. Um, a quick reminder of the life cycle of Lycorma: it spends the winter uh, in egg masses that are covered. Uh, by a foamy substance to form an utica. The nymphs hatch in spring and they start feeding throughout summer. Um, the adults appear in July. There's, they start laying eggs in October, November in North America, and then they die. Um, the, the, the lab I was working in, so Kim and Julie, they, along with collaborators from China, uh, they noticed that there was uh, that Anastatus orientalis uh, provided varying rates of parasitization depending on uh, several locations of sampling in China, which uh, ranged from 30 to 80 percent. Um, this insect has a female biased sex ratio, uh, so it is a good candidate, a promising candidate for uh, classical biological control. Therefore, we think it is important to understand its foraging behavior. Um, now, I'd like to invite you to think of foraging behavior in terms of an evolutionary arms race. So similarly to what we see in mammals or between this cheetah that, is, that has sharp claws and fangs and, uh, and the gazelle that has stamina and long legs that enable it to jump, the same thing happens with these two insects where they are under constant uh, pressure to adapt new strategies in order to maximize fitness. Um, now, host finding in itself is a complicated and uh, is a complicated process that involves, uh, from from the parasitoid's point of view, from from Anastatus' point of view, it involves responding to several cues. Uh, some are long-range cues that are emitted by the plants which uh, the lanternfly inhabits uh, or infests, and some others are emitted by the lanternfly themselves, and these are the shorter range cues. Uh, and we decided to, um, to investigate these ones, the short range cues or the contact uh, cues that, uh, that are needed. Now, again, um, very little was known about the interaction between the spotted lanternfly and, and the egg parasitoid anastatus. Orientalis. Uh, so we decided to start with a system uh, that we that we already knew how to work around, uh, and uh, so we decided to allow the spotted lanternfly adult females to walk on filter papers for around 30 minutes. We then took this filter paper, placed it on the video camera, and with the help of the Ethovision software, we recorded its residence time, angular velocity walking velocity and distance moved. And all these parameters are, uh, uh, certain changes in these parameters are indicative of a motivated searching response. Uh, so uh, if we take a look at the results, here we see in, in pink, the pink boxes represent um, uh, the, the behavior of Anastatus orientalis on control filter papers. So on filter papers that were not uh, uh, contaminated by the lanternfly or any other insect for that matter. And the blue boxes correspond to the behavior of the wasp on the spotted lanternfly contaminated filter papers. Uh, the inverted boxes represent means and the bar standard errors. So we noticed that the wasp spent uh, significantly longer time on, uh, on SLF contaminated filter papers compared with the control. Um, 
Um, it also covers greater distance on the treated filter papers compared to the controls. Um, we noticed that it walks significantly slower on the spotted lanternfly uh, filter papers. Uh, and all these three parameters, so longer residence time, slower walking velocity, and greater distance covered, are all, uh, they all indicate a motivated searching response, as if it is intensifying its searching behavior. Now, the angular velocity parameter, we didn't see any uh, significant difference between the treatment and the control. And this was probably due to the, um, the, large, the, large, the larger size of Anastatus compared to other wasps, uh, wasps we have worked with before, other Celionid wasps. So probably the camera or the software were not able to pick up the, the left and right uh, movements of, uh, of Anastatus. Um, but th these results, they mean two things, basically. First, that Lycorma leaves behind a chemical trail that is then picked up by Anastatus orientalis, uh, which intensifies its searching behavior as if to limit its search to the area where host eggs are more likely to be found. Um, we can say that this is uh, a point for, for the egg parasitoids until now in this arms race, but remember that the, the lanternfly, after laying its eggs, it's, uh, uh, it covers them in, with this foamy substance uh, to protect them from desiccation and also from natural enemies. So can this be regarded as, uh, as a point for the lanternfly itself? Um, to, to, to really answer that, we needed to investigate further, especially uh, uh, with regards to the steps that lead to egg laying. And we, needed, uh, and we needed this information in order to understand the role of the Uotika. Um, to do that, we went egg hunting uh, in Pennsylvania. We brought, back, uh, we brought back the eggs into the quarantine facility in, in Newark. Uh, a subset of the eggs were left intact, so with the Uotika, uh, so they were covered by the Uotika, by the foamy substance. And another subset, uh, we brushed off the Uotika um, uh, so that to, to expose the underlying eggs. And then, and then we, 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 expo we exposed uh, uh, these egg masses, these different sets of egg masses to Anastatus females, and we observed their behavior uh, for 25 minutes uh, for each replicate. And we noticed that the steps that lead to oviposition are the following. Well, first, we have antennal contact, followed by an intense antenation and arrestment on, on one or two eggs of the whole egg mass. Uh, and that step is followed by probing, which involves the insertion of the ovipositor into an egg mass for a period of one to two minutes. Now, if the, egg ma if the egg is suitable for oviposition, this uh, behavior, this uh, insertion of the ovipositor uh, would last for a period of uh, 10 to 12 minutes, uh, which at the end of it is, is coupled by an, um, by an abdominal oscillation, uh, which coincides with the moment when the egg is uh, exiting the ovipositor into the spotted lanternfly egg. Um, now, uh, uh, we noticed that uh, Anastatus uh, preferred uh, or oviposited significantly more frequently in, in egg masses that were covered, so in intact egg masses. It probed and oviposited more frequently in these ones compared to artificially uncovered egg masses. Um, and and for, for egg masses that were, that were uncovered, we noticed that uh, the wasp was confused. Uh, it was probing the bark onto which the egg masses were laid, uh, as if it was lacking a, a certain, a certain, uh, a certain sign or a certain, uh, a certain cue, um, which led us to speculate that the Uotika contains chemical and mechanical chiromones that trigger uh, the oviposition behavior or the, the acceptance and uh, and oviposition by the wasp. Um, and there's also the possibility of the chemical legacy theory, which, uh, 
which states that while uh, anastatus is emerging from the lanternfly's egg mass, it ingests chemicals that later influence its oviposition preferences. Um, now, all the anastatus ori uh, orientalis uh, females that we used in our study um, uh, emerged from, from, from egg masses that were covered by the Uotica. So this might have influenced their oviposition preferences in our study. So what happens to the egg, uh, to, the, to the anastatus egg after, after uh, oviposition? Uh, to do that, we uh, again, we gave anastatus females, uh, uh, in one container we gave them uh, both, uh, both egg masses, so covered and uncovered. We allowed the wasp to oviposit in these egg masses for a period of uh, uh, seven days. And uh, afterwards, we separated the two egg masses, we put them in different containers, and we counted the emerging wasps and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and dissected the eggs to, uh, uh, to check the, if there were wasps that were developing inside. Um, now this work, this part of the project was carried out uh, in Julie Gould's lab and, uh, uh, and the results were as follows. So we noticed that uh, the progeny of Anastatus orientalis was significantly greater uh, from egg masses uh, that were covered uh, with the Uotheca, so that were left intact compared with egg masses that were artificially uncovered. Um, and this means, uh, this probably means that the wasp uh, might be using the Uotheca for its own fitness gains, so to protect its progeny from desiccation and from uh, possible hyperparasitoids. Um, it also means that anastatus uh, uh, overcomes the structural defenses of the lanternfly. So it overcomes the, the, the foamy substance that, that, uh, uh, that, that evolved to protect it. Now the main takeaways from this project are that wasps, they detect the spotted lanternfly's footprints. Um, um, Further, further investigation of this and identification of uh, the lanternfly's uh, uh, chemicals, the spotted, the, the, the chemical footprint of the lanternfly might help us improve parasitoid surveys. Um, uh, we know now that the wasps, they prefer uh, uh, to oviposit in eggs uh, contained within an Uotica. Uh, this has direct implications on the rearing of anastatus and it would help us improve the rearing and if potentially later uh, uh, mass rearing of these, uh, of these natural enemies. Um, it seems that the wasp is ahead in the evolutionary arms race, at least up until now from what we've observed. Uh, several studies uh, need to be, uh, still need to be carried out. Um, now this this research was was published last year uh, along with our uh, with our collaborators. Um, uh, some future studies that can be carried out. Uh, uh, some interesting lines of research would be identifying the uthical chiromones. Um, it would be interesting to investigate whether or not there are long range cues that are emitted from the lanternflies themselves or from the plants that are infested by the spotted lanternfly. Um, now, um, I, I think Joe now, uh, Joe Kaiser will be presenting uh, research on uh, on these on the searching preference of the wasp. So this would help us understand or determine if the wasp is uh, is specific to Lycorma delicatula, if it's species specific. Um, I want to thank my, the, the uh, Kim's lab and Julie Gould's lab and, uh, and a lot of people for making this, uh, this project possible. Um, and thank you all for, for your attention. If there's time, I'd, I'd take questions. I think we're out of time. Um, so maybe if anyone has questions for Robert, um, if you could put them in the chat box. So Robert, if you want to check out the chat box and answer anything there, but fantastic work and great pictures. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Joe, if you want to, um, so if you'll, yep, Joe, if you want to line up, our final speaker for the day 
is Joe Kayser from uh, USDA ARS. Take it away, Joe. Okay, let's see here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, I should be able to keep this pretty brief, but this is just uh, what I'm going to present is some work um, with uh, from I'm a postdoc in Kim Homer's lab at the USDA um, ARS lab in Newark, Delaware, and it's some work that we have done in conjunction with the University of Delaware and um, the Otis lab. Um, and it's kind of an obvious uh, next step based off of some of the work you just heard about with Robert. Um, so as has been, has been discussed, um, spotted lanternfly is a you know, highly mobile, polyphagous pest. Um, and it doesn't, while there are some promising uh, native natural enemies that have been shifting over to kill spotted lanternfly, um, it does seem to be, for the most part, released from uh, natural enemies and is not experiencing, specifically from parasitoids, the same level of pressure it gets in its native range. And um, so this sets it up as a really good case where classical biological control could really help out. Um, the two main natural enemies that have uh, been brought, that we have found in Asia, that have been brought back into quarantine are Dryanus sinicus, um, which is a nymphal parasitoid, and Anastatus orientalis, which I'll be talking about here, which is the egg parasitoid. Um, so uh, the APHIS, the Otis lab um, with Hannah Broadley and Julie Gold have been evaluating uh, the host, host range of Anastatus orientalis. Um, and this has been mainly through no choice tests in the lab where a single non-target host species is exposed in a small area to, uh, to the parasitoid. Um, and a few uh, species have been attacked. This isn't a completely specific uh, parasitoid to, to spotted landerfly. Um, but uh, what's important to note is that um, what we're measuring in those no choice uh, tests is a little bit closer to the physiological host range because it ignores all of the other potential factors that could limit um, host range in the field. Um, so it's important to differentiate uh, when talking about host range, um, the suitability of the uh, host. Um, so how well that uh, parasitoid develops if, it is a, if the host is attacked. I mean, here's some uh, images from the Otis lab showing that um, when Anastatus orientalis attacks spotted landerfly, you get these uh, large, kind of robust uh, offspring. But when you attack Publicia fuliginosa, you get these much smaller ones. So, so it does seem to be that uh, Publicia is a sort of intermediately suitable host, um, but it's not clear if it's also uh, at an intermediate preference. Um, so springboarding off of the work that Robert talked about, we knew that um, these chemical traces left by the, um, the adult stages of spotted lanternfly um, increased uh, local foraging behavior by the parasitoid, um, but we weren't sure if this was the case for uh, any of our non-targets. Um, so what we are assuming is that this improved foraging efficiency um, due to the caramones would increase rates of attack in the field. Um, so does Publicia leave behind similar cues? And uh, do these cues have similar effects on parasitoid foraging behavior? Um, and you can see down here, um, which these were shown in some earlier talks, but the, both the egg masses of spotted landernfly and of Publicia are fairly similar. Um, Publicia has somewhat smaller egg masses and, and the uh, adults are, are smaller as well, but they're, they're fairly similar and both do have that um, co Ophica covering that Robert was talking about. Um, so what we did is we took uh, adults of both the target and the non-target species and we placed them individually on clean glass slides and we left them on those slides for about 30 minutes. Um, so we kind of moved them around and just kind of make sure that they were walking all over the surface of these glass slides. 
Um, so there are three treatments. We have our spotted lanternfly treatment where adult spotted lanternflies were exposed to the slides. Publicia were exposed to some slides. And then we had blank controls that kind of went through the whole process, but no full guards were placed on them. Um, and then we would take these into, uh, into the lab where we had our ecovision set up. Um, and so we have a camera mounted on a tripod over the light and we have this uh, eight centimeter petri dish arena where we would cover a slide and place a single uh, female uh, anastas or in, in the arena with the slide. And so this, is hooked, this camera is then hooked up to the ethovision software and can measure um, the parameters we're interested in. Um, so we would leave this in, in the arena, the, the wasp would stay there for about 10 minutes or um, after it had first contacted the, the slide, um, or after it left the slide for more than 15 seconds. And we measured uh, just the same as Robert discussed, angular velocity, residence time, the total distance traveled, and the walking velocity. Uh, we took a subset of slides that had been exposed to the fulgorids, uh, but prior to taking them into this ethovision setup, and we did a hexane rinse and uh, sent those up uh, with Miriam Cooper band uh, to, to see if we could identify um, the chem potential bioactive chemical components of these putative caramones. Um, but I'll just show you uh, the same sort of four slides similar to what Robert showed you. Um, and so in these figures, you have your control in red, um, like Horma is in green and then Publicia in blue. And so uh, how these uh, graphs work, the, the diamond shape is the mean, the bars are the standard error. Uh, the boxes uh, contain 50% of the data points. So that's kind of central 50% with the bar being the median. And all the gray points are, are data points that kind of fell out in the, uh, the edge 25% of the data. So right here we have angular velocity, so how quickly it was turning. And as you can see um, on controls, they're not turning as quickly. Um, and just sort of what this looked like in the arena is the, the wasp is just kind of darting back and forth across the arena, running around on the, the lid and going in circles, kind of like you would expect a, you know, a, a small hyenopterin to do in that sort of setting. Um, and then, uh, so, so for both like Horma and Publicia, they were similar. Um, uh, but but publicity, you couldn't differentiate between the control, statistically differentiate between the control or Lycorma. Um, so we just ran an ANOVA and a, a Bonferroni correction for multiple comparison for all of these um, and log transformed when needed. Um, so for the distance moved, again, you see uh, there was more uh, distance covered um, for Lycorma. Um, and uh, again, there was no, there was no di uh, ability uh, for us to statistically differentiate between Publicia or the control. Um, and this, this distance move is partially determined because uh, there was much greater residence time. So when they got on the slides that uh, had the chemical traces of like Horma, they just stayed a lot longer and ended up moving a lot further. Um, and again, you see it, it you know, kind of keeps trending as though it is somewhat intermediate, um, but there's, we're, never, we're not able to statistically differentiate between Publicia and the controls. Um, and again, they, they uh, slowed down a lot um, when they're on Lycorma. They kind of, um, and, and just sort of what this looks like is you'll see them, uh, so the slide is sitting in the middle of the arena. And when you first put them in, we wouldn't put them directly on the slide, we put them outside. Um, on the, in the petri dish arena, and they start running around, running around, and, this, and the second they would touch a contaminated, a slide contaminated with Lycorma, they would almost immediately halt and start uh, antenating the surface of the slide, um, which I think is important to note. There's uh, some very similar work that has been done to this, uh, looking at Trisulcus japonicus, a, a parasitoid of the brown marmorated stink bug, and you notice similar behaviors in that egg parasitoid. Um, and so it seems to be, this does seem to act like a contact caramone and not, um, it's not a sort of volatile caramone, although they're, they're, um, 
there, there, there may be some volatility. So it's not clear at what distance these are active, but just sort of anecdotally observing the, the behavior in the lab, it does seem to be that they, they're running very fast and then when they, they make physical contact with the contaminated slide, that's when they really change their behavior. So the conclusions here is that Anastatus orientalis did exhibit uh, this behavioral changes consistent with motivated searching as, as Robert discussed um, in response to the traces left by adult spotted landerfly. Uh, for cues left by uh, the native Poplicia, uh, parasitoid movement was never statistically different from controls. Um, although, you know, it's, it, this may be uh, with greater replication, we may see it fall out somewhere intermediate. It did kind of tend to trend in that direction, but was never statistically different. Um, and so, and these results are consistent with the uh, no choice uh, host range testing that's been going on in the Otis lab, um, that Publicia is a less suitable, it's a less suitable host, and it seems to be uh, the traces left by the non-attacked stage, the adults, um, uh, seem to be less preferred or just don't, they don't induce the same sort of change, the local foraging uh, change that we see for spotted lanternfly. Um, our attempt to identify the chemical uh, components of this putative caramone were, were unsuccessful um, due to very low concentrations of the collected residue. Um, and we did get a little bit of contamination to um, of some honeydew, although whenever we did see honeydew uh, present, we, we wouldn't use those slides, but, um, but there was some that still came across. So, so we're gonna try to do this again and, and use more sensitive techniques to try and uh, determine what are the components left behind by a spotted lanternfly that Anastatus is responding to. Um, and let's see here. Yeah, so uh, future work though, um, there's, there are these other non-targets that are being attacked and, and we wanna take a look at those and see if, if any of those are uh, leaving cues that Anastatus may respond to. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people to thank. In particular, Kathy Tatman um, has helped a ton with uh, setting up these behavioral bioassays and shipping materials. A lot of material movement back and forth between the Otis lab and, and ours. Um, and I do, like, why did I include this very blurry picture of a spotted land of flying nymph in the corner? It's because this morning, so I, uh, I, I live in Philadelphia and this morning I woke up and this was in my bedroom. <laughs> By the window, there was a, a spotted land of flying nymph. Um, and so they're definitely out. I was curious if this was a rare event or if there's just a lot, a lot of them out in Philly right now. I know I had heard uh, that there'd some, been some emerging and I went out in my backyard where there's some grape and there's, uh, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of nymphs crawling all over the place. So we're gonna have lots of organisms to work with this year, right, in the field, I think. That's it. Fantastic, thanks so much, Joe. That's a great yeah. presentation. Um, uh, we have time for questions, um, and Joe's our final speaker, so um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. I don't see any yet. Stop. It's a lot of compliments. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, great, thank you. So we can open it up um, with, for uh, questions from, from anyone, um, to any of the panelists or just in general. Um, but I, you know, before, you know, while people are, are writing their questions, I just want to thank um, all of the presenters for presenting today. It was such useful information and really interesting and the day flew by. And I just want you probably um, just to announce to everyone, we've kept well over 100, 100 attendees for all talks throughout the day. So that is great. Okay, I'll just echo what Julie said there. Thanks so much to the speakers. All really awesome, um, exciting information. I think the people who have been attending have been um, very engaged as well. So thank you to those folks who've been watching, um, many of you all day. So. So we're playing, um, I need to send out an email.